Hello, good morning, and welcome to The Coding Train. It is a Wednesday, it is 10.30 in the morning here in New York City, and I am your host, Dan Schiffman, live here on my YouTube thing that apparently is what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> One portion of my life, that is, at least. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. I was not here last Wednesday. Uh, last Wednesday was spring break uh, at New York University where I work, that's my day job. Um, and actually where I am broadcasting from right now. Um, so I missed last Wednesday, but I'm here again this Wednesday. And for the foreseeable future, for the next month or two, Wednesday mornings, Eastern time, will be the time of the coding train. So what are you watching? You're watching a person, me, Dan Schiffman, who comes live on the internet to code stuff. And I am really excited about what I'm going to do today because I have a new obsession. I even have this, oh no, wrong key. I even have this setup here. Uh, which is that I, my son, I have two children, uh, a daughter who's seven and a son who is 10. And my son has recently gotten into uh, learning to solve a Rubik's Cube. And we've mostly been working with the two by two Rubik's Cube, which seems like that's the starting point. Like, wouldn't that be easier than three by three? I find that two by two cube. But I have learned I, uh, uh, to solve a uh, three by three Rubik's Cube. I started trying this over the weekends, probably Saturday or Sunday. Um, I think my, my record time is like 25 minutes or something. And I even still have to refer to a little cheat sheet of some algorithms that I have written down. Um, but I would like to get better at this. I'm really enjoying it. I, I, I can't believe that I'm 45 and I never picked up really a Rubik's Cube until <laughs> last weekend because it's clearly the kind of thing that I'm into. So um, don't worry, I'm not going to sit here and try to solve the cube live, although some of you might actually enjoy watching that. Um, what I am going to do is try to program a simulation of the cube in processing in 3D. So I'm going to create a three by three grid of box objects, each with different faces, and each of those faces having a different color, and then I'm gonna have to figure out how do I apply these rotations and move the pieces around. I really would like to eventually make a coding challenge about solving the cube itself. <laughs> but first, I think it's actually gonna be quite a difficult thing to just make the cube simulation in the first place. So that's, uh, that's the main topic of today, um, just looking in the chat here, let me pull up. Oh, I'm, I'm, I don't have the Slack channel. Um, so I'm gonna open up my Slack channel. So if you're wondering, so I often refer to as a Slack channel. The Slack channel, if you would like to become a member of the Coding Train or join via Patreon, you will get a Slack invite. The other reason why I bring that up is because I am working on, uh, I am working on a new playlist of content called data and working with data and APIs in JavaScript. And I have actually recorded video tutorials for all of this content so far. 1A, the fetch function. I've got a parsing a CSV file, making a line chart with chart.js. Those videos will be coming out sometime soon. But I've decided actually for this new experiment, I'm recording these not during a live stream. So I'm kind of doing double duty here. Actually, we did this on Monday. And so another benefit of signing up to be a member or a patron is I will share you share with you this content a little earlier as I'm kind of putting it together because there's a bit more post-production, which is really unlike me, but thanks to the talents of Coding Train editor extraordinaire Mathieu, we're doing some more post-production stuff with this content. So a lot of it is actually just uh, with me on the green screen talking about concepts and then we animate stuff after the fact. I, I kind of want to show you a, um, uh, two of the examples. I don't actually, mm, if, bear with me for a second. All right, I want to show you the examples. Um, so this is one of the examples that I'm going to be walking through how to do in this tutorial. This is a, uh, an SS snake is mentioning code bullet, which I will reference, definitely. Um, this is global average world temperatures from, uh, um, compiled by NASA, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, SS. I forgot what that stands for, G-I-S-S, <laughs> G-I-S-S. Oh, I was right, Goddard Institute for Space Studies. This is global Earth temperatures from 1880 to 2018 graphed, parsing a CSV using chart.js. 
And then the other example, which is quite similar to things that I've done before, is this is the location of the International Space Station in latitude and longitude on top of a map built with, uh, a map is coming from leaflet.js. And if I program this correctly, it should be moving. <laughs> well, maybe there's a bug in my code. I haven't made this video tutorial yet. But the goal of this example is to have it uh, refresh and move. All right, so that's coming. Um, I'm working on that stuff. Um, if you want to follow along with the examples and the sort of syllabus for this playlist, all of that is here. A shout out, thank you to Joey K. Lee, who is helping prepare materials for this second and third module of this uh, course that I'm going to publish. Uh, one, uh, that's starting to use Node and databases and stuff like that. So it's going to be exciting. All right, now, I want to mention something else that's new. Uh, Coding Train welcomes a new sponsor for today's uh, a live stream, and by sponsor, I actually mean a sponsor, not my joke about H2O. Uh, thank you to brilliant.org. Uh, you can, I think if I, you can sign up uh, for free at brilliant.org slash coding train, and also as a benefit for, uh, if you want to uh, buy premium access, the first 200 subscribers who sign up will get 20% off. So I'm going to come back and talk about um, brilliant.org a little bit later. It's a really amazing website to practice and learn a lot of math and science uh, stuff. So many things that I do on this channel, <laughs> there are, and, and actually, I was in looking at it over the last few days, I was like, oh, there's a whole module on there on sorting algorithms. Ah, oh, remember that live stream I had a month or two ago where I did the quick sort and I totally failed and you might not notice that no published video ever came out about the quick sort? Well, that's because it didn't work out, but I'm gonna try that again today. In addition to the Rubik's Cube, I'm gonna try doing the quick sort. I was reminded by it by looking at brilliant.org and reading their tutorials and quizzes about the quick sort got my head thinking about it. I figured it out, and I think I'm ready to code it today. So I'll come back to that. My plan is start with the Rubik's Cube, take a break, do the quick sort. Um, I'll, take, uh, I'll give you a chance to sign up for brilliant.org during that time, and then I will come back and finish the Rubik's Cube all in the next two hours. What could possibly go wrong? Nothing could possibly go wrong. I have papers. Today I have papers with me. Uh, I have my <laughs> algorithms. I have some information about brilliant.org to help me remember uh, the things that I want to say about it. And here we go. All right. Mm, ah, oh, but before I do any of that, let me do what I like to do as my opening segment here on the coding train, which is look at stuff that you all have made. So my most recent uh, videos that have been published, the edited versions of the live streams, were all about the number pi, pi day. So I did this video about uh, counting uh, the digits of pi through colliding blocks, and this was all based on the work of 3 blue, 1 brown. Uh, I, the Leibniz formula, which is an infinite series of fractions that you can use to approximate pi, I did a video on that. And this other weird <laughs> video about uh, counting the number of iterations at a certain point in the complex plane in the Mandelbrot set and arriving at the digits of pi. So um, people have submitted their own versions of these. No one has submitted a Mandelbrot uh, community contribution yet. So you could be the first. You watching this right now could be the first person to submit. Um, but I'm, let's take a look at, let's look at the pi day collisions and the Leibniz formula ones. Uh, so here we go. Let's look. I'm just going to kind of click through these so we can see them. This one is fast P5 implementation by Matei Adriel. I remember Matei was in the chat giving me lots of advice. So I think what Matei, so we can see, okay, we got, we approximated three with a mass of one. Let's try 100. We should get 31. There we go. 10,000, we should get 314. Missing the clack, clack, we want the clack. Uh, so we can see this works. Now, I, I, I would have to dig into the code and I would uh, recommend that you do this. My, I think, if I recall correctly, that there are some optimizations in this particular code that, that make it run faster. You notice mine really slowed down, chugged to a halt once I got to a certain number of digits. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, let's look next at, oh, processing versions with big decimal by Daniel mm, Schiefman. Interesting. I think I'll skip that one because it's in processing uh, and I can't easily run it. Animation without using pi. Huh, what's that? 
So this is the same. Oh, I like this. So this is nice to be able to visualize the actual velocity values. And many people point out, you should read the comments on my video. As many people point out, you don't need this animation at all. It's all just about exchanging the velocities. Um, and so you could actually do this counting calculation uh, without, without the animation. And then I remember this one. I'm very excited to show you Pi Collisions Visualizing Optics by Anurag Hazra. So this one is really wonderful because in the three blue, one brown video series, in the third part, Grant references how you can make a calculation of the number of collisions based on a ray of light bouncing in this slice of pie, so to speak. And uh, Anurag uh, visualizes this in this one. So you can see this, we, don't, we can see this is representing the ray of light and each bounce. So we got, whoa, I don't know what just happened there. Oh yeah, we've got 31414 collisions. I don't know what that number is. <laughs> um, and so that's cool. So I can, let me add two more, uh, uh, two more zeros to get uh, one million. Oh, we have the clack. I didn't hear the clack before. You gotta love that. It's so beautiful. All right. Uh, okay, so that's great. And the source code is right here. I love how people are adding interface elements. Um, let's take a look at the uh, Leibniz ones. Uh, there are a bunch of these. We see another one by Anurag here. Um, my interactive version of the Leibniz formula for pi by Sahil Kat Katkaeti. And I, I'm, I've really got to work on something. Someone, if, you know what would be an amazing tool? I should have people when they submit their coding challenges to also like submit a little audio file of them pronouncing their name <laughs> because I, I don't like mispronouncing people's names. And oh, this is nice. So this is a much nicer design of the page. Oh, you can scroll, oh, scroll in to zoom in and out on the graph. I'm not sure how that works exactly. Um, you can change the speed um, and we can see the source code here. Restart with a button. I love that. Wonderful. And I, and I just love, you know, the beautiful digit pi right there. Great work. Uh, the, display the average of the last two iterations. So this is a really smart way of doing it um, because the average of the last two iterations, right, it's the approximation is also always oscillating around, um, around the number pi itself. So we can see this is a nice, uh, we can see how by looking at the average of the last two oscillations, uh, last two values, that's really our sort of more pure approximation of the number pi. Okay, and I think we've got one more, two more to look at. Another by Anurag, um, which did some clever different ways of visualizing the series. Oh, I love this. Woo, I, I'm, I'm having some like Fourier flashbacks here. Beautiful work. And the circle display. I haven't looked at this one. Oh, interesting. Oh, I, look at this. What is going on here? Is this some kind of, is this just show, oh, this is maybe showing me what the digits are? Three, one, four. Oh, I love that. So nice. Um, uh, visualization uh, idea about how to represent the number pi or at least the current approximation and where it's off by colored circles. Great work, that's a very creative idea. Okay, all right, so now, look at me, I'm so like organized today. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna open up processing. I'm going to find my way into the chat here. Uh, Uh, okay. And, um, all right, so, sorry, I'm looking at the chat. Let me get set up here. I don't want to mess it up because I want to be able to have this to reference. This no, I do this. Oh, the camera's on. Better have this ready. There we go. So high tech today.
session here. I didn't realize that I didn't realize that code bullet I know I've seen the code bullet video on solving a Rubik oh no this is it this this must be the video that I watched right I, I now I'm confusing myself I don't think I think that code bullets video doesn't so here's what <laughs> record scratch this is what I'm interested in, as a thought experiment. Could I use neuroevolution? Could I take the current configuration of a Rubik's cube and have its, uh, its configuration be the inputs to a neural network and then the move, there's really only a certain number of moves, forward, uh, you know, forward clockwise, counterclockwise, backward, clockwise, counterclockwise, up, clockwise, counterclockwise, bottom, counterclockwise, <laughs> right, clockwise, counterclockwise, left, clockwise, counterclockwise. How many is that? <laughs> six. There's only, only a certain number, six times two, 12, whatever. No, yeah, something like that. Anyway, the point is, could I use a neural network to decide what move based on the current configuration? Now, this would typically be solved with uh, reinforcement learning, some type of policy, a reward system. And uh, there's actually, a, I, I, in a quick Google search last night, I found a paper for someone who had solved Rubik's Cube using a neural network and reinforcement learning. And the reward system was based on uh, actually starting from the solved cube and trying to like find a configuration backwards similar <laughs> to where you currently were. But I, I would be interested in trying the neuroevolution technique to just basically like make a bazillion random neural networks and see how they do after a certain amount of time. The question is, how do I evaluate how close they got to the final solution? And I think I could do that in some ways by like counting the number of, uh, the number of pieces that are in the correct place. That could be a score. So I'm interested in trying to do that, but before I can even do that, I need to just make a Rubik's Cube simulation. So I'm not doing any of the AI stuff today. If I'll be happy if I can see the Rubik's Cube on the screen and I can apply like at least like one move to it. That's kind of my goal for today. Um, the middle move. Yeah, I, is the middle move a move? Like, so because the middle move, if I do this, this, is, this, this discussion was coming up the other day. If I, I'm so bad at this. If I do this, ah, <laughs> that was like the middle counterclockwise. But isn't that the same as bottom clockwise, top clockwise? So really the middle is just a two other moves in sequence. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can score the progress. Okay, thank you. So the people, so if you have ideas for this, um, let's talk about it. So I'm going to get started. I'm gonna use processing. Um, I've got my cube. And I think I'm just gonna begin. Put the Rubik's Cube on top of green paper, turn on chroma key, and then you can only show the Rubik's Cube. Ooh. That is a clever idea. I will consider that in future Coding Train episodes. Um, <laughs> pretend that I'm solving it. <clears throat> That was completely fake, by the way. Welcome to a coding challenge <laughs> on the coding train Rubik's Cube. So, um, what? Ah. <laughs> Let me try that again. <laughs> what would be like, what's, mm -hmm. okay. I'm gonna get my sequence down. Mm -hmm. Aha! <laughs> so that was fake. Um, Welcome to, <laughs> it was already solved. Welcome to uh, Coding Challenge on the Coding Train. <laughs> Rubik's Cube. So today, um, a while back in April 30th, 2018, Niels Webb suggested a Rubik's Cube solver using a neural network. By the way, this is the green side. It's not the white side. See? <laughs> okay. Um, and 
Uh, I'm really interested in this. And I actually picked up a Rubik's Cube over the weekend. I've been learning to solve it. Uh, it takes me at least a half an hour, but I do do it. I don't have to watch a video while I'm doing it. Uh, I did have to watch a bunch of videos to figure it out. I'm getting off topic. Um, and, but I really want to explore this idea. What types of AI machine learning algorithms can I apply to solve a Rubik's Cube? This will be interesting to try at some point on the channel, but there's a lot of steps I need to get to before I can get there. So what I'm going to start with today is just actually creating a Rubik's Cube simulation. Um, Simon Tiger also posted an issue showing all the different kinds of Rubik's Cubes configurations that are out there. Apparently there's this 28 by 28 by 28 one. I have some of these at home. They're super fun to play with. Uh, um, anyway, but so, uh, so let me close all this stuff out. I should also reference uh, CodeBullet. CodeBullet is a YouTube channel that has many different coding, exciting, adventurous topics. Um, and uh, CodeBullet has a video using a particular algorithm to solve a Rubik's Cube, then makes a giant Rubik's Cube. So if you want to get the 16-minute um, version of everything that's going to take me the next 700 days to figure out in one video and be entertained, I would definitely recommend the CodeBullet one. All right, so closing that out, I am going to start here in processing. I'm going to hit Save um, uh, and call this uh, Rubik's, I don't know, Rubik's Cube. Why not? Put it on the desktop. <laughs> What's my first step? Processing, if you're not familiar, is a Java-based development environment for creative coding, images, animations, all sorts of stuff. I use it a lot on my channel. I'm pretty sure that's what CodeBullet used for, uh, for his Rubik's Cube. Um, I'm going to add the setup and draw functions. I'm going to add a uh, window that's 400 by 400, and I'm going to put in P3D. So P3D, I definitely need to use a 3D renderer because I'm going to represent <laughs> the Rubik's Cube in three dimensions. So what do I need? Let's make, I have an idea. Let's make a, uh, I'm going to call, let's make a class called box. I'm going to call each one of these little, little cubes inside the larger cube, each cell of this 3 by 3 grid, I'm just going to call it a box. And uh, so I need a constructor, and I need to know where is it, well, there's, I need to know its index in some type of like maybe multi-dimensional array. But for drawing it, I, I really just need to know where it is in the, the virtual 3D space. So let's, when I create it, let's give it an X, a Y, and a Z. And then also I need a sort of a side length. So I don't know whether I need the full side length or a half length. That's gonna definitely going to be something that's going to come up. But let's just assume right now that I initialize it with a full side length. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll use a P vector, a vector object for the position, and a float for that side length. Let's just call that side. I'll call that length. And uh, I'll, I'll use an underscore here to make this a different variable name. So now I'm going to say position is a new P vector x, y, z, and the, um, this needs a semicolon here, and the length is equal to this. So then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a function called show, um, and I'm just here, I'm going to say uh, push matrix, which saves the transformation state, pop matrix, which restores the transformation state. Oh my god, what's a transformation state, you might be asking. So, I'll tell you what it is. What I need to do is I need to say translate to position.x, position.y, position.z. This is basically positioning what I'm about to draw, this box with this length, at this position. And I have a feeling people who are watching this live in the chat are telling me this isn't going to work because I need to color the different face faces differently. I'll get there. I mean, I have to get there at some point. But let me just use the p processing box function, which will just put a box right there. So in order for each box's translation to not affect the others, that's what push matrix and pop matrix does. And I'll put something in this video's description to more about matrix transformations if that is new topic for you. All right. Let's just say uh, fill 255, stroke 0, uh, stroke weight uh, 8. And then I have this box class. So now I need to make a cube object. It's not really a cube object. I'm going to make an array. Now, I could make a cube class. I probably should. But just for simplicity right now, let me make a three-dimensional array for rows, columns, and what's the other one? 
I don't know, if you have a third one, it's the, it's the z-axis, I suppose. Um, and this is going to be, let me make a variable called like dim for dimensions, because in theory, if I do this right, we could just change that one variable and have a much bigger cube. Uh, equals new uh, box, which is uh, dimensions, ah, dimensions by dimensions by dimensions. Then I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to do a triple nested loop uh, with i, i, j, k, uh, i, j, k, i, j, k, i, j, k, and then um, I am going to say cube index i, j, k is a new box at some x, y, and z with some side length. Okay, so how do I figure this out? If this is going to be at 0, 0, 0, this is going to be at 1, 0, 0. If I go down here, I'll be at like 1, 1, 0, back, maybe the last row. Anyway, you get the idea. It's like a grid, but with another dimension. I think I'm doing this right. So, but I need a side length. Let's just make that up right now. Length is, let's say it's 10. So the x would be length times i, uh, the, and the y would be length, and I might have my axes wrong, but whatever I call x, y, and z axis, eh, whatever, they're all just different axes, uh, i, j, k, and so I'm going to say box x, box y, box z, um, x, y, z, and then length. And then, I mean, there's no way this is right. <laughs> Like, how could I possibly get, oh, and I need another curly bracket. Uh, and then now if I grab this for loop and I put it in draw, but all I say now is cube i, j, k, show. I almost want to keep these in another array that's just a one-dimensional array for simplicity. But uh, let's see how this goes. Hey, look. That's kind of like the Rubik's Cubey thing up there in the corner. So one thing I want to do, I definitely want to do, is I want to add, I, I, uh, well, I want to first give it a background. Uh, background 200, uh, or like one, I'll use my number 51, and then I probably want the side length to be much bigger. And let's just run this again. And you can see, oh, it's sort of up there, and I think I need a larger uh, space here. Um, so I need to position it in the center so I can actually see it. And there's a variety of ways to do that. I could just translate to the center, but I'm going to use a library. I think I have it installed. Import library. I don't. This is great. I'm going to use a library called PZCAM. Uh, and I'm going to hit install. PZCAM for processing easy camera is a way, a library that allows you to very quickly get a mouse camera interaction where I can spin around a 3D scene in processing. I've used it in other videos before. So I think if I just say uh, PZ cam cam, and then if I say something like cam equals new PZ, PZ, thank you to Jonathan Feinberg who created this library, PZ cam this. And I forget, this is something to do with like how zoomed out or zoomed in it is. Oh, import, I need to import the library, uh, which I can, uh, uh, do automatically like this, import library uh, PC cam. Was it there and I just didn't see? <laughs> there, ah, there we go, look. Ah, oh, look, hey, <laughs> Cody Challenge finished, thank you. No, there's a lot more to do here, but look at this. That kind of looks like a Ruby suit. Now it's rotating around its little like corner there. I want it to rotate around the center. So what I need to do is I need to have an offset and the offset is going to be uh, half of the full width. So the full width is dimensions times length, and then if I divide that by two, so if I then subtract out the offset, that should give me our nice little cube. No, that's not right. Oh, because here, I, I think this is my like off by, I think the box function is probably using the half width. Oh, but then that'll be off now. No, nah, that's not right. Oh, what have I done? I think I have this off by dividing by two. <laughs> Let me think about this. Let me look at the box function. Uh, 
okay, I'm looking, at, I'm looking at the box function. Dimension of the box in the x dimension. Dimension of the box, so it doesn't really say whether it's half or full width. I'm going to assume it's full width. That would be the processing way. Oh, no, yeah, no. Dimensions times length divided by 2. Why did that not work? They're called, uh, I'm being told, by the way, these are called QBs. <laughs> four by four. What did I miss here? Box is made from the corner. Oh, the box is made from the corner. No, the, the each one, I think box is made from the center. Right? I mean, it looks like it's off by just this amount, but that doesn't make any sense. What time is it, by the way? Yeah, so that's right. Why? Why? Hold on. If this is zero, this is 10, and this is 20, It could be like this, or it could be like this, right? Where this is 0, 10, 20. So here I take dimensions, which is 3, times length, which is 10, which equals 30, divided by 2 is 15. 0, 10, 20, divided by 2 is 15. So if I offset everything by 15, then in this case, it is at <laughs> negative 15, which is like here. And then negative, and then uh, negative 5. And then, oh yeah, that's wrong. Uh, and then, uh, so it must be drawn from the corner. The box is drawn from the corner. Uh, and then, if, but it, I thought it was drawn like this, in which case it would be at, um, negative 15 would be the middle, and this would be perfect. Oh, but that's zero there. Oh! Yeah, I need to shift it over. Because I want the, because it's odd, maybe. Yeah, because it's not an even number. <laughs> Remove length. Is there a box mode center? You're removing it as if it were drawn from the corner. Yeah, exactly. Which would be right. I'm moving it as if it were drawn from the corner. It's actually drawn from the center. OK. Thank you. All right, here. All right, here's the issue. I actually just made a little diagram. If the box, these are just uh, two-dimensional rectangles, were drawn from the corner like they are in rectangles, uh, 2D rectangles in processing, this would work because I'm just shifting everything over and the middle one is, but they're actually, the middle one is now placed in the center because I'm shifting over by, the total width is 30, I'm shifting over by 15, we've got half here, half there. But they're not, they're actually drawn from the center. So by shifting them over, I end up with the first two on one side and the other. So I actually need to shift it, I need, I need, I'm, I'm, there's, a, there's a half of a length that's incorrect. So there's probably a smarter way to fix this formula, but right now I'm just gonna add another half length here. Uh, and, um, or the offset actually, that's, that's silly. I should really add it in the offset, so length divided by 2 plus this. Um, and now we should have... <laughs> oh no, minus. <laughs> I need to shift it over, but it's... 
<laughs> in the offset, is, the offset is a little bit less. Dimensions minus one, <laughs> that's the issue. <laughs> Hold on everybody. Uh, this is so silly. Change this to 0.5, and this is actually uh, dimensions minus one, times length, and then half of that. And now, we should have it, there we go. There's my Rubik's Cube in the center. All right, and I'm being told, by the way, that these are called uh, QBs. So I'm gonna change that. Uh, class, QB, QB, and uh, QB, QB, and QB. So step one is complete, but as you'll see, if we look at this, whoops, if we, if we look at this Rubik's Cube, each face has a different color. There are only six colors. There's white, red, well, so white on the top, yellow on the bottom, and then red, blue, uh, orange, and green. So let me, make, um, let me make an array with those colors. Um, I think what I can do is just say, uh, there's a data type in processing called color. It's actually just an integer. Um, and I'm going to, let's come up with an order. I'm gonna to say top, bottom, I don't know if this is a good order to do, but top, bottom, uh, I'm gonna think of the top as always white. So top, bottom, and then right, left, front, back. Uh, right, left, front, back. And I know there's like actual Rubik's Cube notation and I'm probably getting that a little bit off. I think it's actually not top, bottom, it's up, down. Up, down, right, left, front, back. Um, so let's try that. So the colors are for up is uh, white, and I'll do that in hex. Uh, down is yellow. What's yellow? <laughs> Somebody, does anybody know the hex colors for all of the uh, Rubik's Cube? Use a right-hand rule for the order. What's that? Bottom is white? Okay. I mean, bottom is white. Up, down, right, left, B, F. Up, down, okay. okay I've got cubers in the audience here. Yellow is up. Down is white, wait. So up, this is up, yellow. This is down. Mathieu, I think we can edit this part out. We'll just, uh, I'll just come back to it. Uh, red, okay, wait, hold on. Uh, so if up is yellow, down is white, right is green, uh, left is blue, whoops, and um, front, is, front is red, and back is orange. Why well, uh, orange? Orange is, is just like less green. <laughs> Something like that. Um, oh, I probably have to do this. New int. Oh, I don't have enough. Just missing. Do I need the new int thing or will it be fine? Um, let's break this up. Okay. Up, down. The colors are not represented correctly. Um, White up, green front. Okay, white up, green front, is what I'm being told. Wow, this video is very serious about their Rubik's Cube stuff. By the way, as a bonus, anybody sticks around to the end of the live stream, I'm going to scramble this and try to solve it. That'll sure be very entertaining <laughs> and very embarrassing. Uh, <clears throat> uh, white is top, green is front. Okay, so white. Oh, and this should be top. Bottom, I don't know whether to say top or bottom, up or down. I'm gonna say up and down. So top is white, 
down is yellow. So then front, right, left, back, oh, front, front, back. So front is then green, uh, back is blue, uh, right is red, and uh, left is Left is orange. Is that orange? I don't know. Up and down, okay. White is bottom. People are very upset about whether white is the top or the bottom. <laughs> oh no. All right, let's, uh, let's phone a friend. No, straw poll. I don't like this one. Uh, white is on a cube, on a cube. White is top, bottom. Uh, and then create poll. All right, everybody. There you go. Which is it? I will, the majority will rule here. FFA500 is good for orange. Thank you. Um, FFA500. I can always change this later. That's what's great about programming. Up yellow, down white. Okay, well, Simon, uh, Simon is generally the voice of reason here. So, um, People are really, this is almost like which, which programming language is better <laughs> kind of discussion. Uh, I'm going to hit view results. Huh. Four votes, it's top. Simon is really specifically saying it's the, well, the bottom can't be orange if the top is yellow. Oh, down. Oh, B is back. Down is right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So confusing. Okay. All right, I'm gonna keep going. I will, I will change it later if need be. Let me uh, see if I can show the straw poll link. There you go. Check Wikipedia. All right, all right. Boy, now I'm really losing time here. Uh, Rubik's cube. Well, it's sort of drawn here with white on the top, but does that mean it's the top in when you're, if you're like solving it? Ooh. Oh, by the way, this would be interesting to just show it this way. Um, Front, back, up, down, left, right, X, Y, Z. Yes, I know all this. I know all this. I know all this. <laughs> all right, I have to give up here. It really doesn't matter for the purpose of what I'm doing. I'm going to have white be the top for right now. I'm going to check the results. Yeah, very close, but I'm going to use white as the top for right now. Just for right now. We can always change it. Okay. All right, I've returned, and uh, I've now finished off this array. Wait, let me, let me do that again. All right, I'm back. I finished off this array with the colors in the order of up, and I know there's some disagreement as to whether yellow is the top or white is the top. I can sort that out later, but for right now, I'm going to say white is the top, green is the front, uh, so white is the top, yellow is the bottom, green is the front, blue is the black, blue is the black. <laughs> One more time here. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I'm back. I, I, I finished off the colors for this array, and I'm using the order up, down, right, 
left, front, back. And I am just right now using the convention as white being on the top. And I know there's some different ways of looking at the cube. You can think of yellow as the top and white as the bottom. But I'm going to use yellow as the top and green as the front. So I have these colors. So how do I then apply these colors to the different faces of these little cubies? I love that they're called cubies. It's like, that's like the greatest thing I learned today. Um, so unfortunately, I will not be able to use this box function anymore. However, I can use uh, my own begin shape, end shape. So what I really want to do is I want to, instead of, oops, what I really want to do is instead of, hold on, I, once I, sometimes when I lose my momentum, I can't get it back. What I want to do is instead of just using the box function to draw the full three-dimensional QB, I just need to use quads. I can use four quads. I can probably use rectangle function or, or different things, but I could do one quad, well, it's more than four. I need to do six. One quad, another quad, another quad, another quad, and another quad. Um, now, of course, if we look at the actual cube itself, each of these corner pieces, you can only see three faces. The middle piece, you can only see one. Uh, it, um, the, I forget what these are called. Corner, middle, whatever. <laughs> these other pieces in the middle on the top, you can only see two faces. But I'm just going to do all the faces for each QB. We can, we, can, we can optimize later if need be. So let's just do one. So in other words, if I say begin shape quads, then I can create the vert, ver and let me just say the um, r equals um, length divided by 2. So now I'm going to take that side length and divide it by 2 because I want to set the vertices offset from the center. Negative r plus r, negative r plus r. So I should be able to do for the first one vertex uh, negative, negative r, negative r, 0. And I'm going to keep the z at 0 for this first one. And then, um, so let, let me just diagram this, right? If this is what I'm doing, this is, you know, negative one, negative one. This is uh, one, negative one. This is one, one. And this is a negative one, one. So basically, I just need to set all of these vertices to draw that quad. Um, and the negative r, r. Uh, what did I say it was? r, negative r, 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 uh, negative r, r. Uh, and now, if we run this, we should see, oh, whoa, what did I just do? So first of all, oh, you know what I'm doing? Uh, I'm still drawing the box. <laughs> yeah, take out that box. Thank you very much. And there we go. We can see, am I, and we can see now I have just those front faces. So all I need to do is do exactly the same thing. I just need to do six of these. So with different, um, with different axes. So if I put 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and take the, the, basically take the 0 off of the z now, I have got, oh, wait a second. This is not right. <laughs> it's kind of interesting, though. Oh, because now I actually, uh, Whoa, I forgot that PZCAN does this. Ooh. What did I do wrong here? Create a function that draws a quad by passing a normal vector. Oh, that's a good idea. This is some messy code. <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. Wait, well, how come this didn't work? Um, Because if I'm translating to the center, oh, oh, I'm so silly. This isn't zero. This is either at negative r. This is one side. 
And then this same face, oh, so comment this one out, would be at R, right? These don't cross the center of each little QB, they go along the edges. So the Z has to be, so now we can see, now this is right because it's a three by three cube. It looks like, why is there four? But these are, these are the front and back, or the left and right, or the top and bottom, however you want to consider it. And so now, if I do this, with um, negative r, of course, of course. And then the same thing with positive r, right? There are six faces. There we go. Now I have my Rubik's cube, but without the left or right or the top or bottom, I have no idea what the orientation is. So, but the y-axis basically needs to be fixed. So this is z being fixed. Um, this first one was Z being fixed. This one is X being fixed. So I'm going to say a Z, Z fixed, uh, X fixed. And now I need to do one that's Y fixed. And that is going to be, um, so this one I copied, what did I copy? I copied Z fixed. So all I need to do is fix Y. So negative r, negative r, negative r, 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 and then this should be uh, negative r, negative r, uh, r, negative r, 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 negative r, r, and same thing here, negative r, negative r, r, negative r, 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 negative r, r. Look. There it is again. There's our cube, but all different faces. So I have no idea. Let's just make a total guess here. What if I say just for this, so let me do, let me do a fill on all of these. Fill 255. Fill 255. Fill 255. Fill 255. Ah. Fill 255. Fill 255. So now they're all white, but I can say, I remember I have my colors, and what I'm actually gonna do, let's make some, I, there's thing, let's make some variables that just keep these. Let's do top, oh, let's do up. Oh, these are key words in, um, <laughs> these are key words in processing. Uh, let's do them all three letters. Up is zero. Uh, down is one. I just wanna like keep track of these constants, final, is that a thing? I don't know. I don't know how Java works. There's probably like an enumerable. Down, right, left, uh, front, and back. This might, I mean this is sort of unnecessary, but let's do that. So now, up, down, right, left, front, back. So in theory, I want to say fill, if this is the top, I have no idea if it is, whatever the top is, fill uh, colors top, up, <laughs> up. Yes, that's the top, it's facing, whoa. Oh yeah, it's white, I shouldn't pick white as the first one. <laughs> Fill colors, they're all already white. Down, <laughs> all right, let's find where that is. Is it gonna be on the bottom? No, it's facing us, but that's fine because the way I drew it, this is really the top over here, I think. So that's fine, I mean, I, whatever the, the point is, I just have to be consistent. Uh, colors, so this would be if Y is fixed, um, if Y is fixed, we're doing, oh no, if, if Z is fixed, Z is fixed, it's front and back. So behind is back. This, of course, this is front. And then if Y is fixed, it's not really fixed, then we have top. Um, that's, that's actually bottom. And then this uh, would be, and it's down. <laughs> And this is up. Boy, this is taking a crazy amount of time. I can't believe how much time this is taking. And this, everybody in the chat I'm sure is going crazy with better solutions to this. Uh, X, this is left. And this is 
Right. All right, let's see. Uh, oh, hold on. <laughs> let's look here. Oh, whoops. Not using enum. Can somebody tell me how to use enum? Maybe in the Slack channel, I'll fix that. Because I actually don't know how to use enum. Okay. All right, let's take a look now. Can I get the orientation the same? White, and then, no! Oh, but this is mirrored, right? Oh, wait, no, no, it's fine. Wait, ah, yo, I can hold it any Oh, okay, I can hold it any way I want. Yes, okay, white, green, orange is there. Oh, it's, no. Help, I can't, I can't, I can't figure it. I can't look at it this way with the view. All right, that didn't work. That's not gonna work for me. Do I have it off? All right, let me look. All right, let me check this. I have white, green, red, orange, yellow, blue. Ah, red and orange are in the wrong place. Red and orange are in the wrong place. Uh, so did I get, um, did I, left is red. So left, left should actually be in the way, if, if green is the front, these are actually wrong. So, <laughs> so actually, actually drawing it is correct. I just have the color swapped incorrectly here. So this should be orange on the left and red should be here on the right. Let's take a look one more time. And now I think if, uh, if I put this here, <laughs> Uh, you can kind of see, right? And I'm looking at it on the green. I'm looking, if I bring this down, it's green. If I go this way, it's, it's uh, blue. <laughs> I, that doesn't work. <laughs> I, all, right. all right, let me try this one more time. And if I look at it, I'm looking at green and uh, with with yellow on the top, fine. White on the bottom, orange, red, and blue. Okay, so my Rubik's Cube here is mirroring, and I think my y-axis is flipped, so all of you who wanted yellow to be on the top, congratulations, you win. All right, everyone, um, I'm not by any means, oh, did I have this on there the whole time? I moved the wind. Let me, let's do this one more time for Mathieu's editing purposes later. Let's check it. Here we go. Oh, I'm in debug mode for no reason. So, okay. <laughs> let's check it. Here we go. All right. So I'm looking at green with yellow next to it. So I'm now holding it the same way. Green with yellow next to it. So if I go uh, orange, red, white, and on the back, blue. All right, so this is the actual configuration of the standard Rubik's Cube. Um, I have it. Now, this video is not over. Um, the next thing I need to do is figure out how to do this. And so I can scramble it up and, do, and apply rotations to it. Enum, oh wait, I want to add the enum. Enum colors. How do I do it? I'll also say the nice thing is for those of you who wanted yellow to be on the top, looks like I drew it with my y-axis flipped. So everybody wins. I'm using white as the top in my variables, but when we see it, yellow appears on the top. So excellent. I feel like I am being lied to. How many times has this happened before? Live, acting, there's only one movement that needs to be coded. Oh, that's interesting. Um, refactor time, my green is green screened. Yeah, all right, hold on, I'm gonna be taking my a break and doing my quick sort. Make this multi-part. Yeah, I think this, I, this probably should be multi-part. 
Yeah. Um, I will figure that out later. Um, but yeah, let's, let's assume this is going to be multi-part. So I am going to... What sides that should be black? Oh, yeah, I'll deal with that later. I'm going to just let there be extra colors in there. <laughs> All right, how do I do enum? I have to look up how to do enum. I don't know how. <laughs> enum Java. Java. Oh, just like this? That's so easy. Oh, what's wrong with me? No, but if day... Color, public enum color. Public enum directions. Maybe I'll do side. Okay. Before I wrap up this first part, let me let me at least. Uh, it's very painful, apparently, for a lot of people to watch this that I'm not using enums. Enums are not something that I'm used to. Um, I found the Java documentation page about what enum is. It's a special data type that enables a variable to be a set of predefined constants. So, which is really exactly what I'm doing here, but in a much more sort of like awkward manual way. So instead, I should be able to say enum. Uh, could call it like side, and then I can just say up. Uh, how do I, well, let me look at this syntax. Yeah, and then I just put the uh, public enums. I don't need public in processing because uh, uh, pro processing assumes everything is public. So I'm going to do up, down, right, left, front, back, just like that. And then I can delete these. And I should have exactly the same. Mm, no. Oh, it's inner. Everything's an inner class. Is that going to be a problem? Can I have an enum that's an inner class? Did I just? Oh, did I just? No. PCK. Hmm. What did I do wrong? How to use enums? Oh, I see. I see. I see. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So unfortunately I forgot that because processing simplifies um, your Java code and makes everything, and wraps everything in one class, I can't put an enum inside of a class. So what, what I can do is I could make another tab called side.java. And then this would be class side, I think. And then I could say enum, I'll just call it like uh, face, mm, QB. I'll call it face. And then um, I also, this would allow me to, I think it might, I might just use then the actual full words. Uh, left, front, and, and back. So now I should be able to say, anywhere I'm using these, I should be able to say side, back, like this. Side, front. Side, down. Side, up. The reason why it's syntax highlighting up and down is those are global constants in processing for dealing with the arrow keys, which is why I was calling it UPP instead of uh, spelling up UPP, side, left and side right. No. Face, face, face. Oh, no, no, no. I just do this. Like this. Cannot convert from side to int. I'm so lost. Public.
So it's making it, yeah. No semicolon. But how do I, I want it to be the integer value to look up in the array. This is why I don't need to cast to int. Oh, that's so annoying. Color gets int. Use stack overflow up equals zero. No console log values of side. Remove the semicolon down, cast it to an int. Yeah, but I don't want to, this is like defeating the whole purpose of doing this if I have to cast it to an int there. Like it doesn't, can't, doesn't let me anyway. Import side up equals, oh. <laughs> yeah, it has to be, yeah. All right, I'm gonna not put this in the video right now. I will come back. I, I, I need to be mindful of time here. Um, and so someone's going to give interface an interface. Oh, ordinal. I can do ordinal. Okay. Yeah, I feel like I'm defeating the purpose of... I'm defeating the purpose of using enum. Okay, yes, time to pivot. Okay. So Matthew, I'm gonna do a wrap up and we'll, we'll do this in multiple parts, I think. I, I, I don't love the multi-part thing, but I think that'll, th this Rubik's Cube thing is gonna be such a long project that I think I should. So I have now drawn the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> um, I have uh, made some of you happy who, are, who think that the top is yellow because the top is yellow here because I drew it with the y-axis flipped, even though it says top is white in my code. Who knows? I'll figure that out later. Um, something that would really improve this would be using enums, enumerables, instead of these list of constants. It's a little tricky to do that in processing because of the way that processing wraps Java. Maybe I'll fix that up when I refactor this later. But, um, but in the next video, I'm going to work on actually trying to figure out how to do a rotation, how to turn and move the stuff around and actually have all the data move as well so that I could shuffle the Rubik's Cube. So if at least in this first part, if I can now then make the moves, then I can do another part where I can shuffle it and then play the shuffle back in reverse to make it look like it's being solved. That'll be fun. So um, if you want to try, uh, try your own thing, one thing that's, uh, another thing that's really missing here is that um, you'll notice on an actual Rubik's Cube that the, um, the the, the faces that you can't see are actually colored black, <laughs> whereas once I start rotating these, all those other colors are actually there internally. And in fact, there's like a cube in the center you'll never see. It has the colors on it in mine. But eh, you know, Dayenu, I think, uh, I, think, I think I've done enough. Um, see you in the next video. <laughs> eh, I think I've done enough. I will see you in the next video. All right, everyone. So I, it's 1140, I've got about an hour and a half here. We'll see if I get to the third part. I, I, I envision this live stream as in three parts. First, doing what I just did. Second, quick sort. And third, um, and third uh, applying the rotations to the Ruby's Cube. So I am now going to work on, don't leave. Don't leave, there's hours more to go. Oh, I mean, you, could, you could go, I mean, no one's 
required to stay. But uh, give me a second, I'm going to pull up my previous sorting challenge. So, um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, I'm welcoming a new sponsor to today's live stream, uh, Brilliant.org. I'll put up the uh, banner up here on the top. Um, I will give you a few minutes after I do this coding challenge to sign up. Please go to Brilliant.org slash coding train to sign up for free. Um, if you're interested in the premium access, the first 200 subscribers uh, who sign up through that URL will get 20% um, off, I suppose. I don't know how many people are watching right now, but if more than 200, maybe. So if all of you go sign up, I guess first come, first serve there. Um, but what I wanted to show you, um, so there's a couple things that I really have been enjoying about Brilliant uh, recently. So Brilliant is a, a website where you can uh, practice and learn uh, all sorts of different, um, uh, whoops. Um, Of course, of course, my camera goes off during my uh, talking about the sponsor. So it has uh, daily problems in math, science, computer science, uh, lots of interactive topics and lessons. So it's a nice companion. So if you like watching the coding train, it's not a person talking to you, but it's actual interactive puzzles and quizzes and questions with lots of explanations. So for example, I don't know, uh, the other day I was playing around with doing um, the, uh, there was a probability um, daily challenge that I tried, and I worked out the solution in JavaScript. So lots of other people will work out the solution in pencil and paper, but uh, I, one of the things that I really struggle with these days is coming up with ideas for coding challenges. And I get a lot of great suggestions from the audience. I figure, I pull stuff from my teaching here, but um, 
I'm finding that Brilliant.org is a really great place for me to discover some new ideas of things that I want to try. In particular, if I go under practice and look under computer science, there's a whole section. First of all, there's a whole thing on artificial neural networks that I'm very excited to dig into. But there's a whole section on algorithms, in particular sorting. And I was like, oh, and you can see this check mark here because I did it this morning. <laughs> so um, I did it this morning. Um, because I, uh, I was like, oh, quick sort. I tried that on the channel and I couldn't figure it out. So I went through the quiz and the explanations. And now we're going to see what are the fruits of me trying to learn and remind myself about quick sort from Brilliant. I will say that merge sort probably makes sense to learn and practice with before quick sort. But the merge sort, I don't really know how to visualize that. I think I have an idea of how to do the quick sort. So what I'm going to do right now is actually I'm going to take, I need to get some water. So I'm going to take a short break and I'm going to, um, it's be like five minutes or less. When I come back, I'm going to do my quick sort coding challenge. And in the meantime, if you have five minutes now, uh, and you, it, this also supports the work that I'm doing, um, you can sign up for free at uh, brilliant.org slash coding train. Um, and once again, if you're interested in, in premium access, um, you can, uh, the first 200 subscribers get 20% off. All right, so I'm going to just switch to some music and I'll be back in five minutes, five minutes.
I'm really good at the sponsorship thing, aren't I? I'm sorry, my mic was muted, but now it's back on. Uh, I noticed here uh, that Simon, actually, who, um, coding trained viewer Simon, um, I um, mentioned that there are uh, things that are worth mentioning about Brilliant that he likes. Um, daily problems, the eight principles, um, different quizzes, chapters, and courses, um, and there's also a gift membership. So one of the things that this sponsorship is allowing me is to not uh, not monetize the live stream with YouTube ads. Um, so uh, if you like that, if that's nice for you, um, and you want to help me out a little bit by giving it a try, uh, go sign up at brilliant.org slash coding train. And I will be back in just one minute. <laughs> ah! Oh! <laughs> Oh boy, I really, I didn't realize that the music, because I could hear the music, and I reconfigured that page to have the banner, but unfortunately, apparently, the music wasn't working. So, sorry about that, everybody. I've really, um, um, you can see that I uh, um, <clears throat> have some work to do in terms of my, I was doing so well today with this live stream, my professional setup here, but I'm just doing my best. Bear with me, everybody. Thank you, Brilliant. Um, thank you for reminding me about the quick sort algorithm. Uh, please go and sign up, and uh, now I'm going to get back to coding. But actually, I think what I'm going to do is I'm, I was going to do this in processing, but I think what I would like to do, people are requesting the this dot song. Let me actually do this in P5. I think I'd like to do the quick sort in P5, and I will explain why momentarily. Um, um, so hold on, people were requesting the this dot song, here you go. As always, I always forget the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, this dot. This dot, this dot song. This dot, this dot, this dot. Never forget the this dot. This dot, this dot. This dot, this dot song. This dot, this dot. This dot, never forget this dot. This dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. This dot, this dot song. This dot, this dot, this dot. Never forget this dot. This dot, this dot, this dot, never forget this dot.
I'm going to do the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, the this dot song. Never forget the this dot. Boy, this, somebody composed that song for I me. I can't believe I couldn't get this done in the amount of time. Uh, quick sort. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, okay. And then I need to. Uh, Uh, open up the code, and the camera, of course, goes off. What is going on here? All right, so what I, I just want to get, I'm going to start from the bubble sort code. That's why I'm just getting this sort of set up. Um, I'm not sure why. That was oh, because this was visualizing it. Um, why is this J global variable as well? It shouldn't be. Um, minimize this, uh, and now I can get rid of this. And I was doing something just because I wanted to. Um, Uh, I wanted to visualize it slightly differently. Invalid array length. Okay, and then make this 800 by 200 and make this uh, uh, ooh, that's weird looking. Um, There we go. Uh, so bright. Uh, can I make the page? Is that not how CSS works? <laughs> Body, oh, no colon. There we go. Okay. Okay, that's not exactly right, but whatever. Okay, <laughs> close enough. And then uh, let me set the frame rate. All right, everybody, here we are. We are ready to go. I'm going to explain the quick sort algorithm. I'm going to implement it. I'm going to visualize it. And I'm going to visualize it. Oh, you can't see me. I'm going to visualize it in two different ways. And I think maybe. Let me write up here a quick sort with some rainbows. And like a couple hearts and a couple stars and a little smiley face. Okay, that looks good. Oh, you can't see my hearts on the top. That's fine. There we go. <laughs> Okay. All right. So now um, I have the code here, which you can see. Three one three one three one. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Coding rainbow flashback. Okay. Here we go, everybody. Ah, oh, don't worry. I'm still gonna, there's still time. If, so much to do, but uh, hopefully I'm gonna be able to do my, it takes me a half an hour to solve the Rubik's Cube. Highlight the swapping elements. Yes, that's a really nice idea, Harpreet. I'll, I might try that, we'll see. Hello, welcome to a coding challenge, quick sort visualization. Now you might remember coding challenge, what was it? <laughs> Uh, um, okay. Hello, welcome to Coding Challenge Quick Sort Visualization. Now you might remember Coding Challenge number, I already forgot, uh, 114, Bubble Sort Visualization, where I visualized the bubble sort a sorting algorithm to take an array of numbers and put them in order from lowest to biggest, smallest to biggest, lowest to highest, who knows, put them in order. Uh, it could be alphabetical order. You could sort things by all sorts of uh, metrics. The bubble sort is a wonderful, simple, relatively simple algorithm to implement, but it has a big flaw. It is, uh, it's, um, <laughs> let me start over. Uh, let's see. As I want to have the quick sort Wikipedia page. I just started to go down the big O notation. Um, ooh, look at this. I like this visualization. Well, this is way better than what mine's going to be. Uh, worst case, and then so bubble sort. O n squared. Quadratic, right? Not exponential, huh? <laughs> Hello and welcome to a coding challenge. Quick sort visualization. What you're seeing here are the results of my previous sorting visualization challenge where I did the bubble sort. Now the bubble sort is a really nice uh, sorting algorithm to start with. It's, um, it's, it's pretty easy to, well, relatively easy to uh, implement with just some for loops, but it's very inefficient. And it's super inefficient because it is an algorithm that takes on average O, big O, being a, 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 a wet, mm. O, the letter O here standing for big O notation or the order, the magnitude of how long a particular algorithm takes based on how many elements of that algorithm there are. So with an array of n elements, the bubble sort is typically takes O n squared. So the more elements, the, 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 the magnitude of how uh, long it takes to, sol to sort that, that array increases quadratically. Now the quick sort algorithm is on average, a big O n log n algorithm. And I'll maybe at the end I'll come back to like unpack why is this. But this is much faster than this. And there are many other sorting algorithms. Maybe I'll get to them all someday. There's merge, merge sor sort and heap sort and radix sort and all sorts of other ones. And I'm kind of jumping ahead here to maybe a more advanced one, quick sort. But one of the things I love about the quick sort is it's divide and conquer approach that requires recursion. So I've done a lot of things with recursion on this channel before, more, more in computer graphics or drawing a fractal tree or some other type of recursive pattern. But here we're gonna see a recursive function, a function that calls itself. All right, so what else do I need to look at? Nothing really. So here I have the JavaScript code with, that has the bubble sort implemented here, and now I want to change to try the quick sort. Um, if you're looking, I think I should just stay at the board. So let me describe 
uh, and try to diagram out the quicksort algorithm as best as I can from memory ah, before I go and try to code it. So there are really two, there's two important functions that I need to write. One I'm just going to call quicksort and another I'm going to call a partition. And these are not names I've made up. These are the sort of classic terminology for this particular algorithm. So let's say that I have some array. The array has some amount of numbers in it. Uh, three, nine, two, four, uh, seven. I don't know if I put that in a good order for demonstration pur purposes, but let's see. So the idea of a quick sort is to first, <laughs> the idea of the quick sort is to first apply the algorithm to a given array. So I'm going to call the quicksort function on a given array. That's what this is here. And I need to specify what part of the array I want to apply this quicksort algorithm to. I want to go from some start to end. I really should have looked at the algorithm before I started this. I'm like literally just doing this from memory. Um, right. So I know that I want to go from start to end. And then I need to pick the pivot. Um, and I need to put everything. Yeah, I need to just put everything on one, si one side or the other. And then I call partition. Or partition is what does that. Partition is what moves. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. OK, right? Let me just look at the Wikipedia page. Let me just look at the Wikipedia page to remind myself. Yes, exactly. Start and end. Oh, right. And then um, I partition, and I get back the middle point and quick sort again. OK, right, of course. Of course. Of course. Thank you very much, internet. Where was I here? This is going to be on the code. Okay. I guess it's usually called low and high, but I'm going to use start and end. So let me actually, let me start this explanation over again, because I, I now realized I kind of am thinking about it in a slightly different way. That makes more sense. OK. All right. All right. Let me try to describe the quicksort algorithm as best as I can before I start implementing the code. So first of all, let's just say we have an array. And I'll just make a really small array right now with just, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five elements in it. Uh, seven, two, six, five, four. All right, so this is my array. And I'm, the idea here is I'm going to write some function, and I'm going to call that function uh, quicksort. Now, this function is going to expect being passed into it some array. And then it also requires the idea of the quicksort to say, I want to apply this algorithm, the quicksort, to some part of the array. And we're going to recursively subdivide and subdivide and subdivide the array and keep quick sorting different parts of it until the whole thing is sorted. It's like magic. But when we're starting, uh, um, what's going to get passed in is index 0 and 1, 2, 3, and index 4. So the first time I call quicksort, I'm going to say sort the array from 0 to 4. Now, one thing, though, that I'm going to want to check, the whole point, this is going to be a recursive algorithm. So uh, the main thing is, like, start has to be before end. <laughs> right? So the array is going to recursively get subdivided and subdivided. So at some point, if start and end are in the same spot, that's when I'm done. So that's going to be the first step here. If uh, I think I could just say if start is greater than or equal to end, uh, something like return. That's going to get me out of it. All right, but here's, here's the, the, the key. The idea of the quick sort is basically to say, I want to do a step which is called partition. Um, and I need to pick some part of the array that is called a pivot point. 
So I'm going to make a, a nice a sort of easy way to pick that is I'll just have the pivot be the end spot. And the idea is I want to take everything that is less than the pivot value and put it on one side of the array and everything that is greater on the other side of the array. So if I were to do that with this, I, would, I could just visually see I'm going to get a 2. A 2 is the only thing less than the 4. And then the 4 is going to go here. And then the other things are going to be on the other side, like 7, 6, 5. So it does, they don't have to be sorted 7, 6, 5. So this is what I'm doing. I'm taking this pivot putting it in essentially the center, so to speak, the middle of the array, and then everything that's less goes on one side, everything that's more goes on the other side. So this partition function, where I give it the array, the start, I think I still give it the start and the end, and then also the pivot, right? What I then want this function to return is an index value, the index value of where the pivot ended up. And actually, I think I don't have to do this because I can always use the pivot point as the end. So I'll figure that out as I code it, but <laughs> bear, stay with me here. So in this case, what this actually ends up returning is the index 1. Because what I then can do is I can say, hey, now that I got that index of where that pivot is, I want to just quick sort, so I'm going to recursively call quick sort of on that array from uh, start to that index minus one, and then and also quick sort. This is dividing and conquering from that array from index plus one to end. So basically, these are the steps. We get, we start with the array, we find, we pick an arbitrary pivot, we put everything on one side or the other, and then we figure out where that, that pivot ended up, and then we just quick sort the, both sides. And those will put something, so this then, this is done, because it only has one element left, so start and end are in the same, so it will return. This one will pick five as the pivot, and then it will become five, seven, six, because everything's on one side, uh, seven to six are bigger than five, so this is then done, and then this then gets quick sorted, six becomes the pivot, so seven goes on the side, and we're left with two, four, five, six, seven. Whew! So maybe my diagramming and explaining isn't the greatest, and we also have to write the partition function. I mean, that's the whole, how do we do this partitioning? But let's start, I think now let's take, let's go over to the code and start writing it in our code. Where's my, um, where is the cap to my marker? Where is the cap to my marker? I somehow have lost the cap to my marker. Um, I guess I'm going to live without finding the cap to my marker right now. Um, How can I seriously? That's so weird. You know what? I have other markers, so I will just borrow a cap from one of these other markers. Because some of these are probably dead anyway. Okay. Oh! <laughs> Talk about being the bumbling, absent minded person that I am. Look, there's the cap to the marker. It's on the back of the marker. Okay. Um, let me, whoops, let me get to writing the code. Right, um, and okay, so I'm writing the code. Now let me cycle the camera. Okay. Um, All right, so 
All right, so previously, this bubble sort example is designed to visualize the sorting process happening. So what I'm going to do is actually take the bubble sort out and just leave the, um, um, just leave the drawing of the array. And I'm going to need this swap function. So, so the swap function is something I'm going to use. And I'll, uh, hold on, let me. All right, so here I am with my code. Um, previous, I'm going to remove the bubble sort. And I'm just going to leave the drawing of the array. And I'll take out this frame rate 5 thing for right now. Actually, I'll leave that in there. And now if I go and refresh, we should see there it is. Every time I refresh, I'm looking at the array of random values unsorted. So the first thing I want to do is just see, can I get the sorting to work? And then I'll figure out visualizing it is, I guess, the interesting part here in some ways. But let's get it to work first. So the idea, right, we need to write a function called quick sort. It's going to receive an array and a start and an end. And I said, if start is greater than or equal to end, uh, then just return, like jump out of there. Otherwise, I need to get this pivot index where I'm going to partition, partition the array from uh, start to end. So I want to call this partition function. I mean, this is really, <laughs> ironically, I haven't explained the partition. That's really where the algorithm is happening. But I want to run partition. And I definitely don't need um, to pass in an extra argument, because I'm always going to use the endpoint as that pivot. So that's fine. Um, and it, an index is going to come back. Um, and then what I want to do is say quick sort that array from start to index minus 1. And quick, quick sort, quick sort, stork, quick sort, quick sort that array from uh, index plus one to end. So this is <laughs> the basic idea of the recursive algorithm: divide and conquer, divide and conquer. And I'm going to call the the array. I'm going to with I'm going to call it first with values and go from zero to values dot length. Now, do I want to say values.length minus 1? Probably. So I'll, I'll figure that out as we go. Um, because the last element is not the length, it's the length minus 1. Um, OK. So now, of course, we really have to, ah, I just realized. So this is the idea. Now we have to figure out partition. OK. Let's come back over here. All right, so let's figure out partition. Now remember, we have this array, which was, I think it was, I mean, I can use any numbers here, 4, 2, 7, 6, 5, or something like that. I don't remember. Um, let's say this is the array. And so the start is 0. The end is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, is index 4. So what I want to do to partition this is first I need the pivot value. So the pivot value is going to be this. 5. It's going to be the number that's at the end. Then I need to start counting. And I'll use i as a counter. I need to start with i at 0. And basically, what I need to do is say, like, hey, is 4, so, uh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Ah, sorry. <laughs> it's confusing because I have the index numbers here, 4 and 0. Let me get rid of those. Is 5 less than 4? No, it's not. So 4 is going to need to be on the, that side of it. Oh, 4 was, I'm confusing myself because I'm using different values than what I had before. So let me just start over. <laughs> I'll get rid of this because it's an extra point of confusion. <laughs> One more time explanation. What are we, what are we at? 1220? Eh, life, life could be worse. OK. Um, here we go. All right, let's work out that partition function. So let's make up another array that has five elements in it. Uh, 2, 5, 4, 9, 3. <laughs> let's make this 6. No, uh, <laughs> I really want like a good. <laughs> All right, let's, let's talk about that partition function. The partition function is really where everything happens. So I'm going to make an array of just five elements. Uh, 9, 2, 4, 6, uh, 
five. Okay, I think this is good. So when I call partition, right, the first time we call partition, we call it on the array from start to end. Zero, one, two, three, four. So from zero to four. So the first thing that I want to do is I need to pick that, I need to pick some pivot value that I'm going to put everything on the left or right side, on the left side or the right side, whether it's less than or greater than. So the easy way to do this is since uh, I can always just pick the last spot. So the pivot is going to equal, in this case, five. Then what I want to do is iterate from zero all the way to three. I want to look at every single one of these elements and compare them to five. Because if they're less, they should go on the left side. If they're greater, they should go on the right side. So we're going to start with i equals zero, and i is going to go all the way up to um, you know, the length of this array, um, end actually, end minus one. Um, and we're going to compare. So nine is greater than five. Ooh. So nine should be on the right-hand side of five. So guess what we do? If that's the case, swap. So we take five and put it here and put nine. Wait, is that right? Hold on. I forget which. Oh, five was here. No, no, nine was here. Yeah, because then we're going to swap. Yes, that's exactly what we're doing. Let me just make sure. Let me just look at the algorithm again to make sure I'm getting it right. Right, if i is low, oh, actually, we need to go from, we're not, we're, we're going through all of them. This is what I forgot. We need like the pivot index. That's like actually. So I should call that index. We've got to figure out where that pivot index is going to land. And only if we swap do we increment the index. Yeah. OK. I need one more index, yeah. So I'm going to check and iterate and check I'm going to check every one of these elements against 5. If it's greater than, I'll put it on the other side of 5. If it's less than, I'll put it on this side of 5. <laughs> I'm going to check every one of these elements from 0 to n, n minus 1. And if the element is greater than the pivot, than 5, it should be on the right side. If it's less than, it should be on the left side. But here's the thing. I actually need another index. I need kind of the pivot index, because 5, this pivot is going to end up somewhere. And that's what gets returned from the partition function. Partition function. That's the thing that I need to subdivide the array. So actually, let me call this j. And let me call, or actually, I'll keep this as i. So many different ways you could do this. And let me just have another variable that's called a p index for like or pivot, the pivot value. Uh, let me keep this as i, and then I'm just gonna have another variable which I'm just gonna which I'm gonna call index. <laughs> so this is really the pivot index, this is the pivot value. Okay, so 9 is 9 greater than 5. Oh, it is. So I'm going to check if the array index i is greater than the pivot, then what do I need to do? Swap. This is where I need to swap. So I have a swap function from my bubble sort algorithm, and what swap does is it just swaps these two elements. So 5 goes over here, and then I increment if I'm swapping, I also move that pivot index up by one. So the pivot index moves up by one, and i moves up by one. So now I'm checking two. Is two greater than five? No, it is not. So I do not swap, and I do not move the pivot index. The pivot index is still staying here. But now I go to here. Is four greater than five? No, it is not. So I do not swap, and I do not move the pivot index. So I'm here, now. I, but i goes up, now I'm here. This is the last one I need to check. Is 6 greater than 5? Oh, it is. 6 is greater than 5. So I swap. Wait a sec. 
No, something's wrong. Am I swapping if they're, should I be swapping when they're less than? Because six shouldn't end up there. What am I swapping with? I'm so confused. Oh, if it's less than pivot, right, 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 right. Not greater than, of course. <laughs> I always get this stuff wrong, right? It's not, uh. All right, let's just do this out and then I'm gonna explain it again, right? So if the pivot is five, um, is, is five less than, uh, is five, yeah, is nine less than five? No. So leave it there. Is two less than five? No, but what? If nine is less than five, then swap and move it. This is, why am I confusing myself here? <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> All right, let's just try it. Let's just play it out the way that it says on Wikipedia. This is the pivot. Is five, is nine less than five? No, don't do anything. Is two less than five? Yes, swap. Is four less than five? Okay, oh, so now the pivot is here because I didn't move, I didn't move the uh, pivot index. Or actually, the pivot index starts at zero. So now the pivot index is here. Now I'm going to check here. Is four less than five? It is. So swap with the i and j, where the pivot index, yeah. So swap. This doesn't seem right. What am I doing? And this moves here. And then a six. What have I done? I've done something really obviously wrong. Make nine pivot first. It's funny, I, I, I've implemented this so many times, and ev when I, I'm just looking at this again. Let me just look at this. Pivot value is the high part of the array. The, this is the pivot index, what I'm calling index, that's the low part. We start from the low, go if the array, if that spot is less than the pivot, then swap from the pivot index. Oh, oh, I'm not swapping with the pivot. This stays there the whole time. That's what I'm just, no wonder, no wonder. Oh, I'm just being ridiculous. Okay, I'm just being ridiculous, right? So, um, so you know, whatever. It doesn't matter what this array is. I'll, 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 let me just real quick, and then I'll come back and get it again. Ah! Oh, of course, of course, of course, of course. There's the pivot index. There's the pivot value. This pivot, this, this never gets swapped till the end. This stays here the whole time till the end. Of course. So I start here. Is this less than that? No. So I leave it there. Is this? And, and the pivot index stays here. Is this less than that? Yeah. So now, ugh, I swap here, and the pivot index goes to here. Is this less than that? No. Is this less than that? No. Uh, and then now this swaps into here, and this goes here, and we have all the bigger stuff on this side. OK. I just like thought about it wrong. So here we go. Explanation. Attempt number 453. Yeah. Don't worry, everybody. I am now going to explain it. 
in a way that makes sense, and then Mathieu will edit this all together, and everybody will be happy when the video comes out. All right. Let's look at the partition function. This is really where the magic happens. This is the core algorithm. So once again, let's make up an array with just five elements in it. Let's say uh, 9, 3, 5, 6, 4. Uh, let me move, just to make things more even, let me put the 4 here and make the 5 here, OK? Just to, I think, an example will work out better this way. Obviously, any order, the sorting algorithm will work. So the idea of the partition function is when you call the function, you give it the array. This is the array. You give it a start and an end. So in this case, the start is going to be 0. This is the start. And the end is going to be in position 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, in index 4. So this is the first time I call partition. It's going to get called on this array. Now what I need is a pivot value. I need a pivot index and a pivot value. The pivot index, uh, well, well, we'll talk about that in a second. The pivot value, I'm just going to, I could pick anything in here. But it's most convenient to just pick the last one. So I'm going to say the pivot equals 5. And the idea of what I want to do is I want to put everything, I want to rearrange this array so that everything that's less than 5, like the 3 and the 4, are on the left side. And everything that's greater than 5, like the 9 and the 6, are on the right side. And then 5 will be smack in the middle. Now, it won't always work out that the pivot ends up in the middle, because everything could be bigger in it, and the pivot would end up here, and there'd be nothing on the left side. But I made a little nice example so that it works out cleanly. OK, so how do we do this? So first, we need to iterate through every element of the array i equals 0 all the way up to uh, the end minus 1. So we need to check every single element of the array. And we need to compare every single element of the array against 5. I also need to keep track of the pivot index. Because as I go through this process, I'm going to need to find where to, once I'm done, the 5 is going to stay here the whole time. I need to quickly put 5 back into where it's, where it's supposed to go. So that I'm going to just call index. It's really the pivot index. So this is the pivot value. This is the pivot index. That's going to start at 0. And I'm going to put a star here for that it's starting here. So i is now 0. 9. Is 9 greater than 5? Yeah, it's greater than 5. I know that. That means I do nothing. So I'm checking if array index i is, I'm checking if it's uh, less than, actually. Um, it's not less than. If it's less than the pivot value. So if it's not less than the pivot value, I don't do anything. OK. Now i goes up, so i is now here. Is 3 less than 5? Aha, it is. So guess what I do? I now swap i and wherever the pivot index is. Remember, the pivot index was at 0. So 3 and 9 are going to swap. So 3 goes here, and 9 goes here. And then guess what I do? I move that pivot index. So the pivot index is now here, and then I move i, and I'm checking 4. Is 4 less than 5? It is. So I do this again. Swap i and the pivot index. So 4 goes here. 9 goes here, and the pivot index goes up. So the pivot index is here. Then I go here for i. This is the last one I need to check. Is i less than 5? No, do nothing. So I'm done. This is the array. 3, 4, 9, 6, 5. Huh? Well, you can see that 3 and 4 are here. They're less than 5. 9 and 6 in here, they're greater than 5. Guess what? The reason why I need that pivot index is the last thing that I do is I swap the pivot index with end. So now I can just take what was on the end, put it here, put the 9 here, and I have this algorithm has successfully put everything less than, than that pivot value on one side of the array and everything greater on the other side of the array. And the really nice thing about this quick sort algorithm is I don't really have to use additional memory. I didn't have to make a copy of the array to move things around. And the merge sort, if I ever do the merge sort, you'll see you need to start like having extra copies of the array. So that's one nice thing about the quick sort. Should have used i and j, to be honest. Index and i is not a good choice. That's probably a good point. 
So the chat is giving me some good feedback that the way I used I and index is a little bit awkward. I think what I might actually do is name this pivot value in when I write the code and I'll name this pivot index. It's a really, um, that's being very long winded, but I think it'll make it more clear. So let's go write that code now. So if I come back to the code, all I need to do is write the partition function. So I'm gonna write a function called partition. It's gonna receive an array and a start and an end. And then what did I say I wanna do? I need to have a pivot index which is going to start at zero. I need to have a pivot value, which is going to be the array at end. And then I need to iterate from i equals zero to i is less than end minus one, i, i plus plus. And now I'm checking if the array i is less than the pivot value, then what I want to do is Swap, I already have a swap function. A swap function just takes an array and two indices and says whatever was in A, store it, because you're gonna to wanna to put B in A, and then what you saved in A, put it in B. So swap array A and swap array B. So I already have that function. So I can say swap I and pivot index, and then uh, pivot index plus plus. And then once I finish that loop, I just need to swap pivot index and, um, and end. Array, pivot index, and end. Wow, that was quick to write. Is there any chance I got that right? All right, let's run the code. Huh, okay, we got an error. Uh, maximum call stack size exceeded. So this is a very common error, <laughs> um, which is that if you recursively call stuff way too much, things blow up and you've exceeded things. So let's take a look at the code. Oh, of course. <laughs> Uh, this is not where the pivot index starts. You don't always go, remember, I just said zero because I was thinking about doing it over the whole array. But the whole point of this is you're starting at start. Start isn't always zero. That was a nice little mistake there. So this should be start. Is that the only error I have? Let's see. No. So there's some other errors. Let's see. Is start like, is this like actually what I want? No. Oh, it's swap. Oh, oh, yikes, I forgot, ack. So I forgot that my swap function, ugh, my swap function, the way that I wrote it, there's no global array. You have to tell it what array you want to swap the values in. So that needs to be, uh, that needs to be explicitly added as an argument there. Was that the only mistake? <laughs> Still more errors. Wait, let's see. What is it actually saying here? At swap. It should, I have that condition. Forgot the array in line 30. Pivot index plus plus before the last, oh. No, it should end up in the right spot, the pivot index. I don't think I need to increase it one more. It should be in the right spot. Oh, oh, you know what? Here's my other error. I know that this is, <laughs> I know that this is end, so I want my loop to go from zero to n minus one, but I'm using just the less than in my for statement. So I don't need n minus one, I need just end. <laughs> so many errors still. Oh, return the index value. Hold 
Okay, I forgot the whole central idea of this. The whole central idea of this is that the partition function returns back where that pivot index is so that you can divide and conquer, conquer and do the right and left halves. Look at this. I don't return that anywhere. I just finish and I'm like, I'm done. Here's an undefined pivot index. I need to actually say return pivot index. What an important, important key line of code. And <laughs> I'm getting closer, everybody. I equals start. Oh! And another mistake. Oh, I've made so many mistakes. I'm the worst. This is also from start, right? I'm so focused on thinking about the beginning first step where you go from the beginning to the end of the array, but the whole idea of this partition function is that you're anywhere in the array. So this goes from also from start to end. There we go. So now there's my sorted array. You can see that the quick sort actually works. <laughs> All right. Whoa, though, now that we're about three hours into this video, <laughs> I, should, I should visualize it. Now, there's a couple different things I could do. It's really tricky to visualize something that's happening recursively because it's not happening in an obvious first step, second step, third step. So let me just draw it at the first step, draw it at the second step. So I think there's two approaches. One is I could actually sort the array and keep track of all of the swaps and then play back the um, play back all the swaps one at a time. Let's do that first. So that's going to be my visualization technique number one. So I'm going to make a uh, uh, I'm going to make a class called a swap, and it's just going to have uh, two variables associated with it. It's which things are being swapped, um, and then I am going to. Um, I am going to also keep uh, make an array to keep track of all the swaps. Then what I want to do is once I have um, once I have my array, I also want to have another array called a backup. And backup is uh, values dot slice zero. I'm pretty sure that's a slice is a way of giving me a portion of the array from a start to a finish, copying it. So this will copy the whole array. Let's just make sure that works. Um, so let's just look and make sure that these are two separate arrays. Uh, yeah, that looks right. Yeah, those are the same values. Just fact check me on that, but I'm going to assume it works. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is every time I swap, right, every time this function is called, I'm going to create uh, a variable called sw, which is a new swap between a and b, and swaps.push that swap. So in theory, uh, now if I run the, run the sorting algorithm and I look at all the swaps, it did 382 swaps. These are all the swaps it did in order some order of recursively. So now I can play back all of those swaps. So what I want to in draw is I want to visualize backups. Right? So oh weird. Did slice hold on. Oh not backup, back up. Back up, back up. Where? What just happened here? Set up. Shouldn't it be a copy? Like, oh, let me just, oh, sorry, I didn't have the console open. Sorry, I didn't have the console open. It was caching my code. There we go. So now I'm seeing the un, ugh. Now I'm seeing the unsorted array backup. It's sorted values. Values got sorted. I'm just seeing the unsorted array. So what I can actually do now in draw is I'm going to have a variable called swap index equals zero. 
And in draw, I'm going to say uh, let a given swap equal let a given swap equal uh, swaps index swap index. My variable names are kind of lunatics here, and I'm going to say swap backup SWA SWB, and then swap index plus plus. So I'm just going to in draw. I'm drawing the backup array and just doing each of the swaps one at a time. Look at this. Now it's happening so slowly because I have the frame rate set at five, but let's just be sure that it's really working and let's set the frame rate at 60 frames per second, which should be the default. There we go. And look, we've got the quick sort visualized. Ooh, look at that. I feel like it needs some music. Whoa. What's it doing? Oh, it <laughs> it's unscrambling it too. Wow, that's weird. <laughs> Fascinating. How many swaps are there? <laughs> All right, I am not sure what's going on there. Let me at least say uh, if Where's the draw loop? If, so I'm only going to do this if swap index is less than uh, swaps.length. Otherwise, no loop. Uh, console log done. So this will tell me if I'm done. Why does it keep going? Oh! Oh! <laughs> So look at this, I'm still adding more every time I swap. I keep adding to the swaps array and it never stops. Oh, no wonder. Oh, how silly of me. So um, I need a, uh, let me just use a Boolean variable like sorted and it's false. And I'm going to say here only if it's, if it's not sorted, <laughs> add a swap to that array. Otherwise, if it is sorted, when it's at the after this, I'm going to say sorted equals true. So now, and let's just make it fewer values. Let's make this uh, 20 so we can really see this go. There we go. Let's see it finish. I think it'll stop now. Yay! Or <laughs> yay! I should never put my hands up here. Let's see it. Let's see it finish uh, now. Yay! Okay. <laughs> I have visualized the quick sort. <clears throat> What do, I, what do I want to do? Different color in the selected. I, I do want to do that. <clears throat> okay. Let's make a. So this is what. This is one way. This is one way of doing it. I am storing all the swaps and just playing them back. But there isn't really a real reason why I couldn't just draw the original array over and over again while it's being uh, sorted. Um, and a way that I could do this is by run the sorting in an asynchronous function. So it's happening behind the scenes and then I'm always drawing the regular array. Um, let's see what happens if I do that. So I'm going to... What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a backup of this code. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to get rid of the swap sorted stuff 
and back up. And I don't need this. And Okay, so this is sorting it. Right. I don't need this anymore. Oops. So I have my code now back to what it was originally. So this is just pre-sorting the array before I draw it. So this is wait now. What happens? What do I mean here? What if I make this quick sort function async? Weird, right? Let's just add that async keyword there. Hmm. Huh. Same deal. Interesting. Let me also make this partition function async. And what's important there, oh, 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 oh I forgot. I forgot something really important. So I'm surprised that even worked. If I'm making the quick sort function async, I'm going to want to await quick sort, both calls to quick sort. I want to be able, those are happening asynchronously, and I want to await them because I want them everything to happen in the correct order. I also want my partition function to happen asynchronously, so I'm going to call put await in front of that. Now, if the async and await keywords are new to you, I will refer you to some other videos where I go through those in more detail. But this is what I'm basically allowing this to happen is that this function quick sort can be called and then draw is going to go on. The thing is the sorting is so fast. You can see it. There's like a little blip there. Right? That little blip where you see it, but it sorts it so fast. What this means is if I could just make something happen, and let's make swap asynchronous, and let's await it everywhere. If I could just add a little delay somewhere, I could force the actual sorting algorithm to slow down, but draw would still be animating. So there are other places where swap happens there, swap and swap. So how do I make this slow down? Well, I could use set timeout, but what I want is I want a function that's like delay that I could use await. And I'm going to have to write my own function for doing that. So timeout for a second. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to add the timeout into swap, time.sleep. But that doesn't work. There is no. Is there a time.sleep that returns a promise? Does that actually work? I didn't think you could do that. I thought I have to write my own function. Yeah, this is what I want to do. This is what I was going to do. This might be a bad idea for various reasons, yes. So, on Stack Overflow, I found this nice piece of code that basically takes set timeout, the set timeout JavaScript function, which has a callback, which is callback based, and resolves a promise when set timeout finishes. And this is the equivalent of an asynchronous sleep function. It's kind of like a wait and don't do anything, wait and don't do anything for this amount of time. So I'm going to bring this function into my code. I'm just going to put it here on the bottom. And now I can say await sleep. 1,000. What that means is, hey, before, before you swap, just wait a full second and let's see what happens. I think my sleeping might be too long, right? A full second. So let's just bring that down to 10. And we can see, there we go. So now we're seeing the animation. Now this is probably a bad idea for a variety of reasons, because I'm not being very careful about what is the frame rate of my animation loop, and where, am I, where are the swaps happening. I'm just letting it kind of work out mostly by accident. But I think this should let me do things like, say, uh, if i equals the current pivot index, 
Is that a global variable? I might not be keeping track of that globally. So, um, yeah, so I want this to be, um, I want a global, let me call that, because um, I'm already using pivot index here, uh, but that's fine. Let me make a variable called like uh, global, <laughs> I can't think of variable names. Uh, <laughs> I already used pivot index. Let me just say red pivot as a, for a different variable name. And I'm going to say uh, as pivot is changing, um, let's, oh, well, if it's any of these though. So there's multiple pivot indexes. Ah. I should have kept track of a list of all the pivot indexes as well. This is actually trickier than I think. Yeah, actually. Now I'm realizing, of course, this is recursive, so there's many pivot indices. So actually, this is perfect. What I want here is like, I'm just going to call this pivots. And I'm going to make that an array. And every time, um, every time I am in, let's see. Oh, let me see. And every time I get one of these indices, I'm going to say pivot pivots dot, I'm going to add it to that array. And then I think there's a way for me to just find it and take it out, right? So isn't there a way to give an array a value and remove it? Uh, array JavaScript remove value. I guess I have to find it to remove it. So there's no native function. Oh, index of. Index of. I can use index of, right? So then after this is over, let me grab the the, that particular, uh, where it is in the array, because it could, the different things are going to add things to the array everywhere, so I could say um, index of pivots, I can actually just do this, pivots splice, um, wherever that value is, pivots index of index one. So this is going to remove it. So this should be make, continuously making an array of all the pivots. And like in theory, if I just say, let's just console log that. This, this is like, I've lost my mind here. Let's log that in draw. Uh, Sketch.js line 47. Oh yeah, so let's forget about this for a second. Yeah, so this is all the pivots and then they're gone. This is perfect. So now if, in uh, pivots, index of i is greater than it's greater than negative one. That means it's in that array. Then what I want to do is fill it as red. And let's really slow down the frame rate here. Let's slow down the frame rate to five, and we should see, right? Well, that happened so quickly. Um, let's. Oh no, the frame rate doesn't matter. I want the frame rate to be super fast. I want to slow down the swapping more. Ooh, how come I'm not seeing, oh. I think I'm like, the timing is kind of off. <laughs> let's make it, um, let's, let's have many, many more elements.
Does this look right to people? I guess I should be removing the, um, it's coloring after pivot, really. I mean, it, So maybe it actually makes more, so that was interesting, but maybe it actually makes more sense for me to kind of think, keep track of things I want to color red, not here, but actually as I'm moving the pivot value here. This is sort of crazy. So like I want to basically every time I increment the pivot, right before I increment the pivot index, I want to get rid of it. And then I want to add it in every time it increases. And I also should be putting it in uh, right here. Yes, this makes more sense, right? Yeah, that's the pivot index moving along through the whole thing. And then it's waiting over there while it's doing this one. Shouldn't it be doing them simultaneously though because it's recursive somehow? Maybe all the await, oh, because of the await thing. I shouldn't have the recursive call be asynchronous because it has to await. But this is right now. It's just, I want it to animate on both sides. <laughs> it's kind of, but this is right. This is kind of interesting. All right, let me let this go faster. I'm going to let this go way faster. Yeah. So that's the pivot moving throughout it as well. Yay! <laughs> All right, one more try. Uh, let's, let's, um, let's make the width just one, let's let it happen with just five milliseconds of sleeping. Let's get rid of my console log and let me run this. Oh wait, where's, oh whoa, 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 no stroke. No, if it's a rectangle. And let's, um, let's full screen this by saying a window window width, window height, let's do a width of two, um, let's actually have the stroke also be 255 and or red, and here we go, view, enter full screen, refresh, enjoy! <laughs> All right, there's your quick sort visualized. Here's the thing, I, uh, my, uh, I spent so much time figuring this out that I wasn't really being thoughtful about how I might visualize this in a nice way. You could add sound to this. Um, wait, hold on. <laughs> let, me try, let me try my end explanation again. I should probably just record this in front of the green screen, but I'll just leave it like this. Um, Do green after sorted, yeah. Replace await quick sort with await promise all quick sort quick sort. 
Would that do both? Yeah, sorry, the mouse. Is, oh no, this mouse is in the way. All right. Let's try this again. And enjoy. All right, I have an idea. I have an idea. What if I just make the um, quicksort function not asynchronous? So this doesn't have to wait for the recursion, because swap only happens in O, but partition is. Oh, yeah. So this has to be async, though. Uh, or what if? I mean, I could use, I don't have to use a weight. I could say partition, then um, like if I say let index equals negative 1, and then I say partition, Can I just do that? Oh, and then, oh, right, no, 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 this. If I do this, No, it's still doing it one at a time. It's still got to await partition one at a time. You would think it would just be able to keep going. If Promise.all, is that the color of the subset being sorted with a third color? And the, the dancing sort videos. I know. I don't, I'm afraid of like including those. Um, hold on. I, oh, it's 110. My goodness. Well, let me see if I can finish this off here. Um, So that didn't change anything. So there's a promise.all. I don't understand how I'd use promise.all. Everyone is telling me promise.all. Um, so let me go back. Keep everything async. Oh, you mean I could just start adding them? So await promise.all. So if I have a function quick sort needs to be async. I think I might have to figure this out another time. I was thinking like I don't want to await go though. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to await. The point is, I don't want to await. I want to let it go. Yeah, I don't see how I could use promise.all. Partition.all, quicksort, quicksort. Whoa. iCubic is saying partition. All 
I think I'm going to leave that up as a uh, leave that as a challenge. I think I'll leave that as a challenge. So what could I, I could color something differently, uh, like start and end. So since it's doing it one at a time, I can actually just store the pivot index globally. So I could say current pivot And then I could say here, all right. So let me go all the way back, actually. Matya, this is going to be kind of crazy. Um, but I think we can get rid of my whole thing of making this array. Oh, it's still red. What's red? Oh, because I didn't. Uh. Okay. Okay. I keep saying erase the two separate calls to quick sort and replace them with await promise all quick sort quick sort. Oh, fascinating. So why is it Do I have to explicitly like Oh, because if it returns nothing, there's no promise. I think this is the problem. Oh, oh, I forgot the brackets, okay. <laughs> hey. It's interesting. Getting close. Oh. 
oh, I messed something up. Whoa, I messed something up completely. <laughs> what did I do? Oh, no. I got rid of that by accident. There we go. Okay. Oh, look at that. Yeah, okay. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Yeah, look at that. Oh, that is much more exciting. Okay. Oh, now I have to put my weird, crazy array, store the pivots in there. So who is that? iCubic. I want to, I want to thank iCubic in the chat. All right, so hold on. So one thing that I noticed and that the chat really just helped me out with is that because I am using a wait here with each separate quick sort step, the actual sorting visualization is kind of do, it's not, ha the recursion is not happening simultaneously. It's doing one half, then the other half, then one half, then one half, then one step by step, which is kind of nice for visualizing it. And that's really, really fast. Um, let me put in a, a, a sleep time of like, 25 milliseconds, and you can sort of see how this is happening little bit by bit by bit by bit, and then it's done. However, I forgot that I could use promise.all. So I could await promise.all both of these calls to quick sort at the same time. So if I do that and just paste this one up here, this is getting to be pretty goofy advanced JavaScript stuff, but this is basically saying, hey, you can go do both of these simultaneously. I'm just going to wait for both of them to finish. And this, in theory, can you visually see the difference of that? I don't know how obvious that is to you. It'll be much more obvious if I did something like color the various pivot points. <laughs> Let's see if I can do that. And I have a really goofy idea of how to do that, which I think is probably terrible, but I'm gonna, this is the last thing I'm gonna do before putting this aside. So what if I have an array, because there's multiple pivot points that are being tracked. What if I have an array called pivots? And any time, should I, should I draw the pivots as they're moving, or just draw them as they're, let me draw them as they're moving. I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do overkill. This might not be the classic way of visualizing this, but basically, whenever there, I get a pivot index, I want to add it to this array. I really want to use just like a lookup table. I actually, that's what I should use. Aha. So I, what I want is an array. This, I really want an array of true and false. Like, is it, what, what's the state? Let me do this. This is much better. States. So as I'm creating my values, the states of every single um, spot is going to be negative one. So the, the, what the current status of a particular element of the array is, is how I'll choose to color it. So in the case of whenever I get a pivot index, I'm going to say pivot, I'm going to say states pivot index equals, z, uh, equals uh, zero. So negative one means nothing, zero means it's a pivot index. So this is a little bit ridiculous, but let me just Bear with me, and now I'm going to say if uh, uh, if states uh, index equals zero, which is meant for pivot index, fill make it red. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, 
make it uh, white. Oh, this is going to be good. I think this is going to get us what we want. So you can see anytime there's a pivot index, it set it to red. Now I'm not unsending it, I'm not unsetting it. So one thing that I could do then now is I could say uh, here, if, I, if I'm moving the pivot index, right before I move it, let's set that back to negative one and then set it again to uh, zero. So now you can see the pivot indexes are moving. Now again, I'm not unsetting it when it's done which is sort of a problem. So I suppose if I wanted to do that, I could also say states index. This is, this is where it's like finished. There you go. So it's happening very, very fast, but that's the pivot stuff moving around. I don't, again, I don't know if I'm doing this in the right way, but it also might be interesting to, as I am sorting between start and end, any given active partition, like I could do I equals start, i is less than end, i plus plus, I could say states index i equals uh, 2, I don't remember, or 1. And then I could also, at the end, after I'm done, uh, set it back to uh, negative 1. So I could say that if, else if states index i, equals 1, then maybe make it blue. Again, I, I'm not being really too thoughtful about my color schemes, but let's see what happens here. I don't know. That's kind of like what's going on. Let's give ourselves a much bigger space to work with. Let's actually make, uh, let's make this the full window, uh, window height. Let's make the uh, let's make the width of each one just five, and most and let's um, let's make the width of each one five. What am I doing next? Let's make the width of each one five. And then I think I probably want to say no stroke here. Because um, if they're thinner, that might mess up how it looks. And let's, like, let's make 100 milliseconds sleep time between each swap. And let's go enter full screen, hit refresh. Let's do this again. And I'm going to let you enjoy this. I'm going to step aside. These colors are terrible. I, I gotta have different colors. This is cool, it's also too slow. Actually, I can leave this full screen. So I need to change the colors. Um, let's make it, all right, I need to change the colors. Those were no good. So let's do something like this and uh, something like uh, this. I don't know. I'm not good at picking colors. Uh, and then, um, and then, let's see how that looks. Mm, mm. The pivots aren't marked. Oh, because I'm un. <sighs> because this is undoing the pivot. No, but this is awaiting the swap. Oh, so ah, oh, and then there's another mistake. If I don't want to, uh, if i is pivot index, so as long as ah, uh, if i is not equal to pivot index, I don't want to undo. I don't want to undo the coloring of it being uh, currently sorted. So I think I just want everything to be much brighter. And I, maybe if I just use HSB, 
Can someone make me a nice color palette? <laughs> right, because that's the pivot moving. So that red, let's, I, I have an idea. I like these colors actually. They're just, they need to switch. Where did I do the colors? Are these col let me change, let me change the colors again. 255, 25, 100, 100, 25, 255, and now let's uh, refresh. Okay, so I'm gonna, oh, that blue I feel like needs to be brighter. Uh, 150, 150, 100, 150, 100. It looks so weird over there. It just needs to be much brighter. Oh, and not, there we go. I forgot that I, How are these colors? I'm so wor the worst at this. <coughs> Let me put this back to 255. D6 FFB7, all right. D6 FFB7. And what was the other one? Uh, E077D. There, that's pretty nice. Thank you. I want to switch them though. All right, this will do. Let's make it faster. Let's also make these 10. And let's make it... All right. All right, thank you to the chat who offered these colors as suggestions. <laughs> I'm gonna just leave it at that. Um, I'm gonna make the uh, lines a little thicker. Uh, let's leave the width at 10. Let's make it run a little bit faster. So I'm going to double the speed. And here we go. Whoops. <laughs> what just happened there? And here we go. Enjoy this bubble sort visualization. Hey. And <coughs> here we go. Enjoy this bubble sort visualization. As always, I always forget that this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, I'm gonna do this. It's not a bubble sort, it's not a bubble sort. This dot, this dot, I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. This I'm, my brain is so melted. Is it two o'clock? No, it's 1.30, I'm okay. All right, hold on. Let me, um, bubble sort, okay. All right, I've got the code in the state that I want. I'm gonna play you out with, and give you and let you enjoy this last uh, visualization of the quick sort. And please make a nicer version of this. Add sound, add better colors, do all sorts of stuff. Here I'm gonna hit refresh. As always, I always forget the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, 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 this dot. Thanks for watching this coding challenge. I will see you in the future. Goodbye. This dot, this dot, never forget this dot, this dot, this dot. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be getting back to the Rubik's Cube. It's slowed down for the sake of visuals. Uh, simples called. Don't forget to solve the Rubik's Cube. Okay. Just for everybody who came late, or who came early. I'm not going to do any more coding. But I did say that I would. 
attempt to solve the Rubik's Cube. So let me shuffle, let me shuffle it. I'm shuffling it. The drawing loop has an off by one error. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I feel like I should give a prize to whoever guesses the uh, closest to the amount of time this is going to take me. So, uh, all right, maybe a hashtag. I will send you a Coding Train t-shirt. You have the next one minute to post to Twitter, hashtag train, um, Rubik's Train, hashtag Rubik's Train, at Schiffman. <laughs> um, guess how long this is going to take me, knowing I have to leave at 2. <laughs> and I've been live streaming for 3 hours. It's either how long it's going to take me, or the exact amount of minutes, or, or at what time I give up. And I'm going to start a timer. I don't have an egg timer with me, but this is fine. I will get a um, timer going. Uh, stopwatch. Do exit full screen. Oh, why is my keyboard no longer working? This is so weird. Okay, fine. Okay. So this will be the official time. <laughs> Whoever, uh, no, in the chat is no good. So you, unfortunately, I'm only going to accept uh, official. I'm only going to su accept submissions on Twitter up until 1:35 p.m. Eastern time. So if your submission comes after 1:35 p.m. Eastern time, the submission is not valid. And uh, um, your, the submission is not valid. And um, uh, yeah. I, by the way, I'm really bad at this. I, I only, the first time I ever tried to solve a Rubik's Cube was like three days ago. And uh, I usually follow tutorials, or, which I won't be doing, although I do have some al an al a sheet of different algorithms. Oh, no, 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 three point, t t t by the way, if you're anything less than 15 minutes, I think you're way off, just in case you're wondering. Okay, it's 1.35 now. Submissions are officially closed. Can somebody timestamp the official time on Twitter? Um, help me in the Slack channel. Um, and, uh, and, I'm, and, and you need to give me an amount of time in minutes. Hopefully the, the submissions should all have minutes and seconds. <laughs> and I will send the winner a Coding Train t-shirt of your choice. Wouldn't it be funny if I like memorized all the shuffling moves I was doing and just did it backwards? I, I did not, so, all right. Ready? <laughs> Here we go, and, the, uh, and this is counting like if I have to go to the bathroom, if the camera shut off, this is not, this is the actual real physical time. Any interruptions, there's a fire drill, and I have to leave and come back. This is no, so there's no wiggle room there. This is the actual, one, from when I hit start to when I hit stop. And it, the answer might be I give up. Although I guess I could, could continue, I could come back and finish the live stream later and add those two together. No, but, so it's however long I do this for, knowing I have to leave by two. Okay, so I appreciate all of the users who are guessing in the chat. Um, I don't think I can accept those because it's hard for me to like figure out who you are and like the time codes of them and like see the chat later. So I'm gonna go with Twitter. And I'll do this again if there's a better way to do it. Okay, here we go, ready? <laughs> okay, uh, don't laugh at me. So first what I'm doing is I'm, um, I'm like, I, my heart is beating really fast. I got super nervous. So this orange side piece needs to be with orange. So it's there. I'm making the, I don't know what you call this, the cross first. Um, this is blue. Um, so it's going to go, wait, where's the white and blue? Oh, it's the wrong way, though. Or uh, um, so if I put it up here, but, oh, man. <laughs> I'm so nervous. This is making crazy. Ah, red, good. Okay, red is in place. Red is in place. <laughs> Orange is in place. Uh, now I need uh, the other middle piece, green. 
Uh, green is going to go. <laughs> ah, it's going to go. There we go. Okay, green. No, no, no. The other side. Other way. Where's, where's your friend green? Mm. Yeah, there we go. Okay, green, red, uh, orange. So I just need the other the last one here. Oh, there it is, blue. Okay, good. So I've got blue, blue, orange, orange, green, green, red, red. That's good. Now let me put these on the white side. Now I just need to finish the top layer. So this is white with green. Wait, where's green? Where'd that go? Where'd that piece go? Uh, it's going to go here. Wait, why is that orange now? That's orange. Ugh. Go back. That's the wrong piece, silly. No, you don't go there. You go orange. White with orange goes here. Ah, the other way. <laughs> Wait, this is in the right place. This is in the right place. This is in the wrong place. Okay, everything's going to be okay. This is in the right place. Uh, what goes here? I need a white piece with an orange and a green. Where was that? I just had that piece. Oh, here it is, but it's like on the bottom. Well, that's annoying. Let's do the one that's the, in the right place. White with blue. So that's just going to go here. Uh, no, no, the blue goes over there. That's red. There we go. Come back to me. Oh, wait a sec. Oh yeah, no, we're fine. We're still good. <laughs> we're getting closer. What am I at now? I have only been three minutes. This is not so bad. <laughs> oh, this is like really embarrassing. I mean, it's not embar embarrassing is the wrong word. Okay, let me put this to the side. And then now this is an orange piece. Orange on this side, white here. Where's the orange? It's here. Uh, so this needs to go one over, and this comes down. No, oh, it goes the other way. Rah. Goes the other way. No, where'd you go? Where'd you go, my white piece with the orange? <laughs> <All right. laughs> Hold on a sec. This part I usually do way faster, and this is like me being nervous. Okay, ah, perfect. This has got to go right, this has got to go right, right there. So, oh, but it's on the other side. Ah. There we go. What am I thinking? There we go. Okay, of course, of course. Okay, we're doing well. Now, um, one more piece. That should be easy. Good. Okay, so I've got, I've got the top and one layer. And now I need to figure out, so like this piece here, on the bottom needs to go here. This piece needs to go here from left to right because it's blue goes here, and orange goes there. So I'm gonna go here, left to right. This comes down one, two. Oh, I totally messed that up. No, no, that's right. And put the white back. All right. I don't know if I put that in the right place. Oh, I put it backwards. Oh, because I wasn't, oh, I'm such an idiot. I, the, the bottom thing wasn't matching up. I needed to be on the orange side. No, I did it right. I moved the piece there, but it's the wrong way. I'm going to have to move it back. That's really annoying. But this one, let's get this in the right place. Okay, so this now, here, I'm going to move this from here to there. This goes from here to there. So left, left to right. Uh, left to right. This comes down. This goes here. Put the white back. Okay, that's looking good. Now I need this piece. Uh-oh, right to left. This is going to be hard. It has to go right to left. Right to left. So this goes uh, right to left. This goes here, right to left. This comes down. This goes like this. This goes like this. 
put the white back. <laughs> I had so much trouble at the beginning step because I got so nervous. All right, now green and yellow. Oh, no, yellow is no good. Green and orange. Oh, this goes left, right to left, right to left. So this needs to go here, right to left. This comes down. Do this. This goes back up. This goes here. Uh, there we go. Okay, almost getting there. I need another piece. Yellow, yellow. Oh, this is the piece. Oh, I left that piece there. So I just got to like move anything there, I guess. Move this. So this is left. Oh, well, let me do left to right. Do I have an easier time with left to right? Who knows? Um, left to right, left to right. Move this down. Move this here. This should. This should get it to me. Okay, here we go. Now, now where's that piece? Here it is. It's going left to right. Um, so left to right, move this here. Left to right, move this down. Uh, move this over, move this back up. All right, okay, so I've got the top and I've got Two layers. Uh, I'm at seven minutes. I'm doing way better than I thought. So just so you know now, I have a printout of some algorithms. It doesn't say when I'm supposed to use them, so I still have to figure that out. But, um, uh, oh, and I have, this is the bar. So this is known as the bar. I have the yellow side, so I think I need it to be like this. Do I, should I have these matched up? Who knows? So the bar should be a going across, I guess. And the white is on the bottom, yellow is the top here. Let's see. So I'm going to do forward, right, up, right counterclockwise, up counterclockwise, forward counterclockwise. Okay, that's good. Uh, now I need to get these two corners. Oh, this is the kind of like the fish, but I have this corner already. So I think I can do the next algorithm, which is, and I want it to be facing me, so I want to do right, up, right counterclockwise, up, right, up, up, right counterclockwise. Uh, well, I, I have a different configuration. Hmm. Let's try it again. Somebody, somebody who's like an expert cuber is going to tell me uh, <laughs> how I'm doing this wrong. Which, all right, so let's try this again. Right. Up, right, up, right, up, up, right. Yeah. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah! Don't do that. No, no, no. Don't, 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 don't go there. <laughs> ah, okay. Ah, no, this way. This will do it. This will do it. Oh, I need this to go here first. Let's see. I don't know. Right. Oh, okay. That's better. Different. Something, oh, okay, so now can I, ah, this, this will get me, this will go there now, I think. <laughs> oh, maybe, no, no, I, it's again, ah. <laughs> Uh-oh, uh-oh, hold on. Just messed something up. Uh-oh, I messed something up. No, I'm okay. I'm getting it back. Okay, I'm back. I need to do it from a different corner first. Then when you get the fish, do it the way you know it. Oh, Kevin Hernandez is telling you, there are two yellow corners. You need the one in the bottom right facing you. Yeah, don't I need one facing me? But they're not, it's not there. So, should I do it like this first to move it? Let's see. R2, D, people are giving me, <laughs> all right, let's, all right, let me try it from this way, okay. Ah, okay, now I got the fish the way I know it. Oh, the camera went off. Oh, it's funny that I have my algorithm sheet in the view. 
That's embarrassing, but I guess appropriate. Uh, align the edges first. Okay, so now, I think now I do it this way. Oh, I messed something up, didn't I? No. Okay, this is good. This is good, because now I have this here. Yeah, there we go. Bingo. Okay. Now, do I have same corners? I have a lot of same. Oh my God, I have all same corners. I've never seen that. So that's weird. I'm supposed to put the same corners to the back. Well, let me. All the corners are met. I've never seen that. So I assume I can just pick any side then. Um, right. Cut right. Right, back to right, forward, right, back to right. Okay, I made it worse. Ah, but I have one, just one same corners. Maybe that's what I needed. So now I have same corners. Do it, they should probably match up with their side, right? So let me try this again. Okay. Oh. oh, no, 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 no. This is good. This is what I want. Oh, I'm in the last step now. I need to move these. I did it extra. I did it twice. I undid it because I need to move these. If, if red is here, I need to move the blue uh, clockwise. Orange. No, no, no. Blue goes here. Oh, ooh, they're in the wrong. Green goes here. Oh, I've never seen this. This is bad because they're going different directions. Blue needs to go clockwise. They need to swap. That I've never seen before. <laughs> that I've never seen before. Uh, yeah. Oh boy. I've never seen this before. All right, let me just try clockwise and see what happens. Because this goes clockwise, but this. That I have not seen. I think I really made something crazy happen. Do I need to do the same corners thing again? I guess I could try that. Uh, I'll try this. I mean, what's the worst thing that happens? Um, <laughs> okay, oh, I have one side done. Red goes here, green goes here, and orange goes there. Oh, this is weird. So this is definitely clockwise with one side done. So this should be good. I should be good. This should be the last step. Fourteen minutes, thirty-seven seconds at point five one. But anyone, whoever is close to fourteen minutes, thirty-seven seconds, and fifty-one, there we go. But you know, having my cheat sheet really, I did all the way up to step four without the cheat sheet. That was pretty good. All right, everybody, thank you for tuning in to this live stream. Uh, I somebody helped me track down the winner on Twitter. Uh, this was the time, um, and I'm going to do, it doesn't matter whether you're over or under, if two people guessed 14 minutes. So I'm going to consider this the closest, I, said, I haven't looked, I'm going to consider this, because it took me a little bit to click it, I'm going to floor this and forget the 5-1, so the official time is 14 minutes 37. So I'm going to do it by seconds. If there are two people who tied, I will send two shirts. Um, and I'm just going to do my best. I don't like to do these kind of like 
contest things because I, I feel like I always heard somebody mess something up and somebody's upset. <laughs> but uh, 14 minutes, so if you guessed 14 minutes and 40 seconds and somebody else guessed 14 minutes and 34 seconds, you both get a shirt. Okay. Uh, if people guessed in milliseconds, I'm going to ignore your milliseconds. So your milliseconds don't count, no rounding up, rounding down. Um, I'm just going to ignore them. I, again, I should have made this all clear, uh, but uh, hopefully, hopefully this will be obvious on Twitter. Maybe uh, those of you uh, in the Slack group can help me out here. I did not. I kind of got pi there. Three point one four one five. <laughs> so digits of pi in there. All right, everybody. So what did I accomplish today? I don't know what, 8081 maybe? No, what is going on here? Oh, there we go. I accomplished this quick sort visualization. I floor one, two, three, four, four is the winner. Okay. Um, so I accomplished this and I also accomplished This. I'm definitely going to come back and continue the Rubik's Cube next week. Um, but you can see here's my, it doesn't, you can't apply any moves to it, but I've drawn a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> and I'll come back and continue that next week. I am exhausted. Um, so if you would like to support the work that I'm doing, um, uh, one way that you can do that today with a new sponsor is brilliant.org. Uh, you can uh, sign up for Brilliant at brilliant.org slash coding train. Sign up for free. Um, if you're interested in the premium subscription, the first 200 people to sign up from today will get 20% off. So I am going to say goodbye. Um, I will be back next Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern for another live stream. Stay tuned for edited versions of these coding challenges to come out. Um, later today, oh, not today, definitely not today, by next week sometime. And I will see you all in the future. Thanks for, I am, boy, this was, this was way longer than usual and I definitely need to take a break now. So I'll see you later. Thanks for uh, humoring me with my new obsession with Rubik's Cubes. If you've got any tips for me, any good, I really would prefer to get a book, especially a book about the Rubik's Cube that's appropriate for a 10 year old. Um, I would really love to hear from you um, because, um, uh, you know, watching YouTube videos is great, but sometimes it's nice to be off the screen. And so um, a good book for a 10-year-old about solving Rubik's Cubes or a 7-year-old uh, would be great. And see you next time. I'm going to play you out with this dot song. As always, I always forget the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm going to do this dot, this dot, this this dot, this dot. I'm going to do this dot, this dot, I'm going to do this dot, this dot, this dot. This dot, this dot song. This dot, this dot, this dot. Never forget this dot. This dot, this dot, this dot, this dot song. This dot, this dot, this dot. Never forget this dot. This dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do dot. This dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do do this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this. This dot, this dot, I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot song. This dot, this dot, this dot, never forget this dot. This dot, this dot, this dot, never forget this dot. I'm gonna do the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot song, never forget this dot. Somebody composed that song for me.